Assalamu uh, alaikum, um, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to see you again in our fifth uh, module of Hypertension in Depth by the Emirates Diabetes Society. Um, this, uh, in, this, in this webinar, we're going to uh, discuss um, hypertension and management of hypertension. Uh, we're going to deal with drug and drug interaction, and we're going to discuss guidelines for management of hypertension and management of hypertension in a special population. Um, a last, uh, the last uh, presentation will be uh, by Professor Melanie Davis, and she's going to discuss the management of hypertension in patients with of diabetes in patients with cardiovascular disease. Um, I'd like to remind you that this um, module is sponsored by Al Hikma Pharmaceutical Company, and would like to thank them for their contribution. Now, uh, before we start. Just I'd like to share with you some uh, housekeeping uh, comments. So uh, whoever managed to log in through Zoom, uh, that will be uh, great. However, if you are unable to connect for some technical issues, you can attend the webinar um, in the uh, EDS YouTube channel uh, through live streaming. Uh, again, this webinar is recorded and it will be available later on as on demand at the official website of the Emirates Diabetes Society. I'd like to uh, ask you to type your questions uh, as we go uh, in the Q&A box uh, down there. And if you have any technical issues, you can have a live chat at WhatsApp uh, at the phone number mentioned down here. Um, just a reminder that this webinar is uh, CME accredited by Minister of Health, and uh, you will earn around two, 1.5 to 2 CME hours for this. So without uh, further ado, I would like to start the uh, presentations. And um, the first talk, um, I'll be giving the first talk, which is uh, about drug and drug interaction in hypertension. And I'll share my screen now. So I hope everyone is um, seeing my screen. Uh, so this is the fifth module in, in hypertension, and it's going to discuss the role of drug and drugs and herbal remedies in management and hypertension. So I think it's, it's very interesting that we did this um, webinar in modules, because uh, when we presented the first four modules, um, we have noticed that there are specific questions that are repeated in each and every module. And I tried within this um, presentation, which is around 20 to 25 minutes, uh, to handle some of these questions. Some of them were very difficult to find uh, data. However, we managed to get you uh, some of your answers for some of your questions in this presentation. But I would like to start my presentation with uh, two polling questions that prepares you to the, um, to the presentation. So my first polling question is about the role of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories in um, hypertensive patients. So the question is, use of non-steroidal anti uh, in hypertensive patient reduces the effect of antihypertensives, all of them, except which one of the medicines that is not affected by adding non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? Is it diuretics? Is it the RAS blockers, beta blockers, alpha blockers, calcium blockers? Is it C and E or a combination of A and B? So it's a polling question. The poll is open now. You have 15 minutes to answer, 15 seconds to answer. So uh, it's quite variable. However, 25% uh, uh, thought 
diuretics uh, are not affected by adding nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories. And a bigger percentage uh, said C and E, which is beta blockers and calcium blockers. And a small percentage said um, A and B uh, alpha blockers and beta blockers alone. So uh, my next uh, polling question is about erythropoietin stimulating agents like darbopoietin or epipoietin. Um, the increment in blood pressure associated with the use of these agents may be as high as one to two millimeter in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure or five millimeter mercury, mostly systolic blood pressure or three to four millimeter mercury increase in diastolic blood pressure? Is it 10 millimeter increase in diastolic blood pressure or 20 millimeter mercury increase in systolic blood pressure? So you can choose one of them and you have 15 seconds to answer. So um, again, the answers are quite variable. The highest percentage went for five millimeter systolic blood pressure reduction and not increase. Um, okay, so we're going to answer all these while we go through the presentation. So uh, this is the agenda of my presentation. So I'm going to focus on the role of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in hypertension. I'm going to focus again on the role of erythropoietin stimulating agents and their role in uh, hypertension. Uh, I will discuss a couple of herbal remedies that are used frequently. And I'm going to answer, you know, I've added the last question based on uh, the last section based on many questions that came over the last four modules. Many people were asking, when can we stop the antihypertensive medications? And I went through literature and I'm going to uh, share with you the answer in, in the last section of this presentation. So uh, if, if we look at the medications that we use frequently that can cause hypertension, they're quite variable. We know, uh, and it has been discussed, we know that steroids can cause hypertension. And it has been discussed in the endocrine part of hypertension where we discussed the um, steroids and the mineralocorticoids. However, anabolic steroids as well can cause hypertension. Uh, antidepressants can cause hypertension. Erythropoietin and um, erythropoietin stimulating agents do cause hypertension, not reduction in blood pressure, do increase the blood pressure as well. There are many herbal remedies, immunosuppressants like cyclosporine and tacrolimus do um, um, contribute to the increase in, in hypertension in patients post-transplant of the mineralocorticoid effect of herbal medicines like carbinoxylone and licorice, and we have the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and oral contraceptive drugs. So let me focus on the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And this is just a, a, a background of the effect of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories on hypertension. So we know that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are medications that are used to relieve pain and inflammation. And they're quite frequently used in patients with arthritis and in patients with uh, rheum rheum rheumatologic problems. And we know that they do increase the blood pressure by around two to three millimeter mercury. And there was a meta-analysis done in 1994. And that meta-analysis have shown that non-steroidals do increase the mean blood pressure by about five millimeter mercury. So we're talking about an increase in blood pressure between two to five millimeters mercury. And to know the effect of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, and how do they cause hypertension, we need to go back to basics. So I'm going to take you back to basics and discuss with you the role of prostaglandins in renal perfusion. And I'd like to take you a step by step. If you look at the first graph on the left side, it shows the role of prostaglandins in renal perfusion. Prostaglandins work basically 
by um, stimulating the prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin I2 on the afferent renal arteriole. Whenever there is reduced renal perfusion, they dilate the afferent renal arteriole and they cause increased glomerular uh, filtration. So they do save the kidney by dilating the afferent renal arteriole. However, this impact is not usually of importance unless the patient has significant prolonged renal um, under perfusion, like what we see in elderly patients and in patients with renal failure and in patients with heart failure. Those are people who had reduced renal perfusion. So in addition to the usual um, effect of running angiotensin system, we have the effect as well of prostaglandins. Um, if you look at the uh, chart on the right side or the graph on the right side, it shows where the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories work. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatories do block the prostaglandins and the synthesis of uh, prostaglandins by um, inhibiting the COX-2, cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme. And once they inhibit that, they result, they diminish the effect of renal um, afferent renal arterial dilatation, and hence it keeps uh, a low renal perfusion that might result in acute kidney injury. So from what I said, which group of people are more likely to develop um, side effects of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories? And as I mentioned, they're elderly population, they're people with chronic kidney disease, and they're people with diabetes. And I, I'll put this and I say uh, it's a frequent uh, encounter that I see frequently our nephrologists. Whenever they see a patient with an impaired kidney function, it's a standard note, avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. It's, it's an absolute right practice to always say avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatories in a patient with chronic kidney disease because it worsens kidney function. Now, again, I'll just take you to how it causes hypertension. Now, from arachidonic acid and the effect of arachidonic acid, uh, it has effect on different organs. It, it causes ren renal protection, GI mucosa protection, and cardiovascular protection. And um, when we look at the kidney only, um, it acts through cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. And cyclooxygenase 2, specifically, what does it do? It causes, as I said, afferent arteriolar dilatation, increasing the blood flow to the kidney. And at the same time, it increases sodium and water excretion. So you get rid of sodium and water. And when you use non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, you block this effect. There is no more sodium and water excretion. Hence, there is fluid retention and you get hypertension. So basically the effect of non-steroidal in hypertensive patients is by their effect on the kidney on cyclooxygenase 2, where you block the uh, cyclooxygenase 2 and you prevent excess sodium and water excretion. Hence, they will be retained in the body and they will increase the blood pressure. And the effect of the antihypertensive effect, actually it involves all antihypertensive medications. So if a patient is hypertensive and he's already on antihypertensive medications. When you add an non-steroidal anti-inflammatory effect, you actually reduce the effect of antihypertensive medication. So here there is a drug-drug interaction where you add an non-steroidal, you lose the antihypertensive effect of all classes except, and that was the answer for the previous question, the first question, except calcium channel blockers. There was uh, the effect on beta blockers is a bit controversial. All the studies say that effect on beta blockers is, it, it, it antagonizes the effect of beta blockers. However, there is a small study from Japan that included around 364 patients and they are hypertensive and they were initiating treatment and patients were on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and they started on, on beta blockers as well. And they found that the, if, the difference between the group that received non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and the group that did not receive the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories is minimal. It's only 0.4 millimeter mercury. So even if it has an effect on beta blockers, it's minimal. However, most of the other studies says it has a significant effect. 
on beta blockers. So what about aspirin? Aspirin is a drug that we use frequently in patients with diabetes, in patients with hypertension as either secondary prevention or if the patient had a very high cardiovascular risk and when the benefits of adding aspirin outweigh the benefits of GI uh, bleeding associated with, with aspirin. Um, uh, what I would like to say here is the prohypertensive effect of aspirin is dose dependent. So if you give a small dose of aspirin, like 75 milligram, it doesn't inhibit the COX-2 enzyme. Hence, it doesn't have any effect on, on blood pressure. And this is not just um, like that. It's, it's data from a very large trial, which is the HOT study. The HOT study is a study that evaluated around 18,790 patients. And they found that a group that has received aspirin compared to those who did not receive aspirin, uh, there was no significant difference in blood pressure. And in that study, they used 75 milligram of aspirin per day. So what will be the advice? If I have a patient with, with let's say, rheumatoid arthritis or any um, osteoarthritis, this patient has to be on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and this patient is basically hypertensive. So what should I do? So the first thing, I, I guess, you choose the antihypertensive that doesn't interfere with non-steroidal, and that is the calcium channel blocker. So in this group of patients, calcium channel blockers would be the first choice. The second uh, thing you need to do is um, because non-steroidal anti-inflammatories do retain sodium, we advise our patients to reduce their sodium intake. If you're going to take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and you're hypertensive, then reduce your sodium intake, limit your sodium intake to reduce the uh, effect on blood pressure. We need to monitor the blood pressure actually frequently, and uh, we might need to adjust the antihypertensive medications based on blood pressure monitoring. So we ask patients to check their blood pressure um, uh, frequently. It's also important because non-steroidal anti-inflammatories does affect the kidney. We need to monitor the serum creatinine frequently in those patients initially at two weeks, then at four weeks. And then um, when we're certain that creatinine is normal, then we can do it uh, uh, biannually or even uh, annually. Now, what this is, this is the um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. What about the erythropoietin stimulating agents? I know not all of you is using, is using the erythropoietin stimulating agents. However, it's essential to know about it uh, because around 20 to 30% of patients with chronic kidney disease develop hypertension when we initiate the uh, erythropoietin stimulating agents, darbopoietin or epipoietin. And the mean increase in blood pressure, it, it mainly affects the diastolic blood pressure. And we get average of around 10 millimeter increase in diastolic blood pressure. And this is the answer for the second polling question. So the average increase in blood pressure is around 10 millimeter mercury in diastolic blood pressure. So uh, how can, how, what, what evidence do we have that erythropoietin stimulating agents do increase the blood pressure? Now, this is a study that has included around 251 patients. And they followed those patients uh, those patients were started on erythropoietin stimulating agents, and they looked after three months. The patients were, some of them were already hypertensive and some were not hypertensive at the start. And they found that around 35% of patients who are already hypertensive had an increase in their diastolic blood pressure by around 10 millimeter mercury. What about the non-hypertensive patients? The non-hypertensive patients, 44% of non-hypertensive patients had an increase in their diastolic blood pressure of 10 millimeter mercury. 15% of those, 15% of the total patients, which is 25% of, of the patients who, were, who had an increase in their diastolic blood pressure had to be started on medications. So remember, a patient who is not hypertensive, you started erythropoietin, erythropoietin stimulating agents, then 15% 
had to be started on treatment. Now, is it a single erythropoietin stimulating agent or they are the same? This is um, um, a Cochrane meta-analysis of around 24 trials uh, and included around almost 10,000 patients. And they tried to look at the odd ratios for development of hypertension um, in, while using erythropoietin stimulating agents. And they compare those patients to patients who use the placebo. And if you look at the placebo, which is the white dot in the forest plot, it's at the uh, uh, neutral line. While if you look at all the other erythropoietin stimulating agents, they were actually having an increased odd ratios for development of hypertension. Minimum, minimum um, is around 23%. Uh, if you look at the darpopoietin, the um, odd ratios is around 1.23. It means that there is around 23% chances of developing hypertension in uh, patients when we start darbopoietin. However, it's even higher when we use the apopoietin uh, alpha or beta. It goes to around 2.3%. So the chances are more than double of developing hypertension in those patients. So what are the risk factors for development of hypertension? If, if I have a patient and I want to start him on erythropoietin stimulating agents, how would I know that this patient might develop hypertension? So there are a bit of a couple of factors. If it is there, then there is an increased likelihood of developing hypertension. One of them is if I use these agents intravenously than giving it subcutaneously. If you use it IV, the chances of hypertension are higher. If uh, the patient is on hemodialysis, his chances are higher than being on peritoneal dialysis. If there is a family history of hypertension, the chances of hypertension are higher. And it's important to know that generally, nephrologists try to keep the hemoglobin not at a very high level. They try to just correct the hemoglobin to around 10, um, 10, 10 grams per deciliter because a higher target of hemoglobin is associated with higher um, chances of developing hypertension. And using a higher dose of erythropoietin stimulating agents is associated with uh, higher chances of developing hypertension. So why do patients on erythropoietin stimulating agents develop hypertension? There are many factors and I just go quickly uh, over this. Uh, there are more than eight or nine factors. Uh, one of them is that when you give erythropoietin stimulating agents, the hemoglobin will improve and that will reduce the hypoxia stimulated vasodilatation because when there is hypoxia, there is vasodilatation. When you correct the hemoglobin, the hypoxia drops, then the vasodilatation will disappear, the blood pressure will increase. You need reduced um, nitric oxide levels when you use erythropoietin stimulating agents, increased uh, cytosolic calcium in the vascular smooth muscle. So increased calcium causes more vasoconstriction and increases stimulation of RAS system. So these are basically the mechanisms of developing hypertension. How can we prevent it? We do prevent it by slowly raising the hemoglobin and aiming at not a very high target of hemoglobin. We aim at around 10 to 11 grams per deciliter. And um, if a patient develops hypertension while on erythropoietin stimulating agents, then we should use ultrafiltration to remove uh, more fluids to control the high blood pressure. So I discussed now the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, the erythropoietin uh, stimulating agents. Now, there are many herbal remedies that are known to cause hypertension. And this is a, a long list of, of these um, uh, herbal remedies, um, like including caffeine, the ephedra, and the uh, cat, and the mates. There are many of them that causes hypertension. However, um, I would like to discuss um, specifically because uh, we're, we're in diabetes and endocrine forum, the licorice um, uh, ingestion, and it has been discussed previously, so I will just take it <clears throat> in one or two uh, maybe 10 seconds. Licorice is, is a component of many 
of, of the uh, sweeteners that are used, including gums and, and this. So what does it do? The licorice basically, um, if you look at the graph, the licorice contains a glyceric acid. Glyceric acid or glyce glycerinic acid. Uh, the glycerinic acid actually inhibit conversion of cortisol to corticosterone. Hence, you will have very high levels of cortisol in the circulation. And the cortisol will bind to the uh, mineralocorticoid receptor and causes increased fluid and sodium retention and causes hypertension. So this is how licorice causes hypertension. What about other drugs? Again, in 10 seconds, I will just comment on a couple of drugs. Um, one of them are the sympathomimetics. And these are commonly used, including the pseudoephedrine and, and phenyl, uh, phenylephrine. They are known to increase the blood pressure. And it has a mostly systolic, but it has some variable effect on um, diastolic blood pressure. Uh, what I would like to comment here is uh, if we, we in DHA actually have the Salama, um, uh, what they call the Salama um, system, where if you look at the HPI of hypertension, it asks you specifically about the antihypertensive um, um, medications, including the symbiotomimetic. And it has been used in many, uh, uh, the stimulants uh, are also used in many conditions like narcolepsy, um, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorders, and stimulants increase the blood pressure by around two to 5%. Um, the oral contraceptive bills actually is also associated with an increased risk of hypertension. Um, and anabolic steroids as well, it increases the systolic and diastolic blood pressure and causes left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, steroids, as I said, it has been discussed previously. And um, I would like to, to come to this just for the sake of time to comment on the antihypertensive drug withdrawal. And um, if, um, if I would comment here um, about the antihypertensive drug withdrawal, uh, the question that comes to people, if I have a patient who is actually uh, well controlled, should I withdraw his medications or not? And um, basically, um, the answer to this um, is variable. It depends on many, on many factors. I'm going a bit faster for the sake of time. Uh, this is um, a study that looked at uh, people who has been controlled for almost one year. And um, it has been found that uh, withdrawing the drugs, the drug therapy, uh, they found that around 40% after one year remained off treatment. And after two years, only 25% remained of treatment. And um, the question is, who is going to benefit from drug withdrawal? Uh, the higher success rates of uh, withdrawing the medications uh, basically occurs in people who have a lower pre-treatment blood pressure. So if you start the blood pressure, antihypertensive medications at a very low blood pressure, uh, then um, your chances of um, withdrawing the treatment is higher. A younger patient, usually the withdrawal of treatment is, is much um, successful. And if you initiated a healthier lifestyle uh, in addition to the medications, then the blood pressure drops and your chances of uh, successful withdrawal are higher. So it's basically about a balance between benefits of withdrawing the medicine, the cost effectiveness of withdrawing the medicine, because once you, you withdraw the medicine, then the patient will have frequent, uh, uh, what do you call, visits and monitoring of blood pressure that might be as cost, as costly as using a generic cheap medicine. And then you look at evidence of withdrawing the drug, is it? beneficial to the patient or not. Now, let me take you through this. As I said, when you stop the drug, there is a low incidence uh, and severity of drug side effects, definitely. But you need to monitor the blood pressure on the other hand frequently, and uh, you need to, uh, there, there might be um, a requirement 
for frequent visits to the doctor to make sure that everything is fine. So this cost should be uh, monitored equally. Uh, the, if we look at evidence between the two, now the first, the orange one, there were some observational studies that found withdrawing the medication in elderly population is associated with an improved cognitive, fu cognitive function. So the patient on treatment, when you withdraw the treatment, their cognitive function will improve. But this is an observational study. There is a randomized controlled trial of around 385 patients who are 75 years of age. They found that when you withdraw the medicine, there is an increase in the blood pressure by around seven over three millimeter mercury. And there is actually no improvement in, there is no improvement in cognition, functional status, or even quality of life. The HIVET trial, which is the hypertension in very elderly population, found that actually withdrawing medications from elderly population is associated with an increased risk of total death, cardiovascular and, um, cardi and cardiovascular death. So if I withdraw the medicine, there might be an increased risk of cardiovascular death. Now, another thing to think about when I try to withdraw the medicine, that once I withdraw the medicine, probably there might be a rebound in blood pressure. And this is a study of around 3,000 patients that um, looked at patients who were started on diuretic and beta blockers. And once they started the treatment, you can see at around 72 months, there was a significant increase in the blood pressure to the back levels, back to the levels of a placebo. So increased cardiovascular risk, increased mortality, uh, rebound hypertension. Not only that, they might develop what's called the withdrawal syndrome, which usually happens in patients on beta blockers and alpha agonists like clonidine. They might result in increased sympathetic activity, hypertension, accelerated angina, and myocardial infarction. So if you have to stop, you have to do it to taper it. Um, how can we do it successfully? Um, so, uh, sorry, how do they improve? First of all, um, it has been found that using antihypertensive for a long period of time reduces arteriolar hypertrophy. And once that reduced, the blood pressure will come down to normal. Sometimes it's a wrong diagnosis where it was a white coat hypertension and patient is started on treatment. Then when you withdraw the treatment, you find them having a normal blood pressure. Um, if the patients initiated lifestyle, uh, they usually benefit uh, from uh, antihypertensive uh, medications. Um, initial use of excessive drugs, for example, when you start a patient on two, three drugs initially, while he required only one, when you come to reduce the um, antihypertensive treatments, you succeed because it's uh, actually, um, uh, it was an over treatment at the start. So this is just, I'm, I'm almost finishing. This is just um, a, a study that looked at benefits on maintaining of lifestyle, on maintaining normal tension and discontinuation of chronic antihypertensive therapy. Just look at the graph. Uh, the graph showed patients who has been uh, treated and withdrawn. They found that 39% once they started treatment remained normal tensive and that uh, hypertension occurred later, uh, recurred only in 60% in patients who maintain a healthier lifestyle. And a healthier lifestyle is uh, reducing salt intake, uh, weight loss, and uh, reducing excessive alcohol. So uh, how to diminish the, or discontinue the antihypertensive treatment? Number one, if the medicine is long acting, um, like amlodipine, start using it every other day. If the drug is short acting, half the tablet. And uh, the third thing, you need to closely monitor the blood pressure um, every um, four or five hours, let's say every two to four days and um, reduce the antihypertensive. Now, you will end up with one of two when you start reducing the medication. You either get your patient consistently having a blood pressure still above target. And in those cases, you need to restart your medications again or after one to three months, you'll find that the blood pressure remained well controlled. So those patients, uh, you will fully discontinue the treatment and you monitor them um, uh, every 
couple of months to check whether they have a high blood pressure or not. So uh, this is my last slide. It's a, another uh, polling question. Um, after what I commented on drug withdrawal, I'd like to ask you, um, would you still consider withdrawing antihypertensive medications in your patients? Is it yes, no, maybe, or yes, you will consider it in a small group of eligible patients. Now you can vote and you have 15 seconds. So uh, most of you, I think now is convinced, 60% uh, of you is going to uh, stop it in a small group of eligible patients after balancing between risk and, and benefit. Uh, so this was my last uh, slide. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, these were my references. Basically, most of the references were uh, to look into evidence of withdrawing uh, treatment in hypertensive patients. Um, now, uh, I have seen that Dr. Fathia, the uh, president of the uh, e uh, EDS, is, has joined us. Uh, the mic is back to Dr. Fathia. Dr. Fathia, welcome. Uh, many thanks, uh, Ala, for the excellent presentation as usual. And I just want to remind uh, the audience, we have 668 uh, audience who had connected with us. The Q&A session will be uh, dealt with at the end of the uh, last talk. So uh, I will be uh, proceeding with uh, uh, introducing the uh, second uh, uh, speaker, uh, uh, Professor uh, George Bakri. And um, uh, Professor George Bakri, uh, was with us in the past uh, several, uh, you know, webinars. In the last two webinars, he had joined us, uh, but still I will introduce him. He's a professor of medicine, director of American Heart Association Comprehensive Hypertensive Center, University of Chicago Medicine, USA, and he's the past president of the American College of Clinical Pharmacology uh, and the American Society of Hypertension. And his talk will be uh, the guideline uh, for the management of hypertension. The session is recorded uh, due to some personal reason that uh, Professor uh, Bakris were not able uh, to join with us, but we are grateful to him to take the uh, time from his busy schedule to record this talk uh, uh, with us. And still, if you have any question, you still can, you know, post your question, uh, uh, you know, for the, uh, the Q&A session. So can we have the recording on, please? Hello, I'm Dr. George Backris, and I'd like to talk to you today about the guidelines for managing hypertension. I think we have to understand that guidelines are based on data that are available at the time. And so the term guideline actually comes from mountain climbing. And it's for the leader to provide you a stable path so that you don't fall off the mountain. And that's what these guidelines are for. It's to give you some general guidance as to how to approach patients for treating blood pressure. You can see that these have evolved over time. This is the history of the guidelines in the United States. And you can see here that diastolic blood pressure was the original focus. And you can see how far we have come since the original guidelines in the 70s with being more aggressive with blood pressure control. Systolic blood pressure came later as people were living longer and they realized systolic blood pressure was very important. And again, you can see here the transition over time in terms of how people got more aggressive as we learn more about mortality, morbidity, and blood pressure control. So <clears throat> in the latest guidelines, how do they compare with older guidelines and how do they compare with other guidelines from around the world? And you can see here, the goal is to reduce risk. It's not just reduce mortality, it's reducing risk. And so they use as a cut point, anybody with a 10% or greater 10-year CV risk 
should have a BP of less than 130 over 80. And they gave that a very high level of evidence, 1B. You can see here, obviously, when you're looking at the patient, it's not just the blood pressure. You have to look at modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. And you have to work with the patient to reduce risk. That's what this is all about. The latest guidelines are about reducing risk. And there is a risk calculator, which you can download for your phone. This is an example. And especially for younger patients, you can really help them uh, achieve their goal by showing them the benefits of doing what you're telling them to do. Now, it's very important to measure blood pressure correctly because that is what you're basing everything on. And there is a checklist of things that you can do. And this is the checklist from the guidelines and all guidelines from around the world reinforce this. So this is not just US or just Europe or just Canada. This is from around the world. So it's very important that you follow this. And as you'll see, it's more than one minute to measure blood pressure. This is just to show you the European guidelines basically are saying the same thing. It's also important to make sure that the cuff is appropriately inflated and it's appropriate size. If it's too small, you're gonna get a falsely high reading. If it's too big, you're gonna get a falsely low reading. Now, it's not just about the blood pressure and the medicine. It is about making sure that people are educated about lifestyle. And these are in every guideline since JNC7 in the US, they're in the European guidelines, they're in the Canadian guidelines, they're very important and you need to educate the patient on these things. This is just a comparison to show you the differences in when people are starting to treat blood pressure in Europe, 140 over 90, in the US, if you're at high risk, 130 over 80. The ambulatory blood pressure monitoring data really have not been validated and they're adjusted for the lower readings. The European guidelines are adjusted because they're the old ABPM readings. Now it's important to measure out of office blood pressure, critically important. That gives the patient information about their blood pressure. It's just like their blood sugar. And it's very important in helping managing the patient. White coat and mass hypertension are major players today. They contribute to cardiovascular risk and you will never know if you have these problems if you don't measure blood pressure outside the office. So it's very important to do that. And this is the European guidelines saying the same thing. Now, if you need any hypertensive therapy, the ideal way to do this is to look at what the blood pressure is. Number one, if you are 20 over 10 millimeters above the goal, you will need two antihypertensive medications, not one, two. And as you can see here, the suggestion is to use a single pill with two different medications, an ASARB and CCB or an ASARB diuretic, and they will be in low doses and you can start them that way. If you don't wanna do that, then use two different medications, two different pills, although it's easier on the patient if you use a single pill. But the triumvirate is ACERARB, CCB, diuretic. Some combination of those agents are what is recommended as initial therapy. 
So combination therapy is very important. The data are overwhelming. There are multiple clinical trials that suggest the benefit of combo therapy. And I just can't encourage you enough to be using single pill combination therapy if you're 20 over 10 above the goal. This is from the European guidelines and they're mandating initial combination therapy in all patients so that, that meet the criteria. So this is very important and not just me saying this, this is coming from around the world. And this is the cocktail picture that they have in the guidelines to show you what they're recommending in terms of combination therapy. Now, what about diabetes? Well, diabetes, of course, the goal is less than 130 over 80. The bottom line is that the evidence is very strong for ACEs and ARBs and to get the blood pressure controlled. There was some controversy about the ADA guidelines, American Diabetes Association guidelines, differing from the uh, ACC guidelines. It turns out, this is a study that formally looked at this, it turns out they're very similar. And in fact, over 90% adherent. So there's no real difference. And in fact, for kidney disease, the recommendation is less than 130 over 80 to reduce mortality, reduce mortality. There is no evidence, there is no evidence that reducing the blood pressure below 130 over 80 further slows kidney disease. You have to be less than 140 over 90. But for cardiovascular benefit, you need to go below 130 over 80. And that's especially true if you had large amounts of protein. Now, what about people that are older? People used to be scared to lower blood pressure in older people. There is no reason to be scared. The evidence is very strong, suggesting that if you can get the blood pressure to 130 over 80 in older people, they will do better. You can't do that in everybody because they don't tolerate it. But if you can tolerate it, they will reap the benefits. So clearly you need to try especially in older people, to get the blood pressure down to 130 over 80. The greater the pulse pressure, the, the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure, the less likely you're going to be to get it down that low. But you should at least try. Now, this is the European guidelines. And you can see they're not as aggressive as the American guidelines. But they still tell you to target between 130 and 139, even in older people going up to age 80. So very important. Now, let's compare the similarities and the differences. The American guidelines emphasize home blood pressure, and so do the European guidelines. The American guidelines emphasize single pill initial therapy for people 20 over 10 above the goal, the European guidelines, everybody should start with initial low dose single pill combination. There's a lot of attention paid to detail for measuring blood pressure in the US guidelines, same in the European guidelines. There's a lot of focus on improving adherence in the US guidelines, adherence to medication and diet. And in the European guidelines, they just assume adherence is going to be poor. And you need to acknowledge that. Make sure you understand that the patient should be educated on that and work from there. Now, there are differences. And the U.S. guidelines focus a lot more on CV risk reduction than the European guidelines. Again, the U.S. guidelines start therapy at 130 over 80 whereas the European guidelines, 140 over 90. And as you can see, the definitions are different. And the one thing that's interesting is not to get the pressure too low. And the recommendation is not to be below 120 over 70 in the European guidelines. 
So I want to finish by summarizing all of the factors that you need to take into account when assessing blood pressure control. And this table summarizes everything. So you can see, this is not the simple 30 second measurement, and then you start giving out medications. It's far more complex and far more detailed, and you need to pay much more close attention to doing this when actually uh, taking care of the patients. So I want to finish with that, and thank you for your time. Many thanks uh, for Professor George Beckery for the uh, excellent uh, talk, and I would like to thank him again for uh, you know taking uh, the uh, time from his busy schedule to record this talk for us. Uh, I still want to uh, uh, remind you, if you have any questions, please just type in the Q&A uh, uh, icons and we will be taking those questions at the uh, uh, end of the uh, session. And also I would, would remind you that you will be entitled for CME after you uh, fill the evaluation form and you send the evaluation. Uh, once it gets uh, through, then you will receive your CME uh, through the email that you had, you had recorded to. Uh, so now uh, I will proceed with the third talk, and it gives me a uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Amin. Uh, Dr. Amin is a senior specialist endocrinologist at Dubai Hospital, and he is the uh, Secretary General of Sudanese Diabetes Association uh, Gulf uh, Chapter, and uh, uh, Amin is very active uh, in uh, research and also active uh, academic. So uh, without no further uh, delay, Amin will be covering today hypertension in a special uh, group. I mean, the floor is yours. Please unmute your mic and share the screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Fathia, for the very kind uh, introduction. And thanks extend to the EDS and the organizing committee for uh, giving me the opportunity to come here again in the EDS Connect and uh, hypertension in depth course. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again in the fifth uh, wave of the, of the hypertension in depth uh, program. And um, I've been asked to cover the management of hypertension in a special population. And um, um, fortunately or unfortunately, there will be loads of similarities between my talk and Professor Bakri's talk. However, it may uh, anchor the information more and more, and uh, we'll just be um, confirming or the stressing on some uh, points that has been mentioned earlier in the previous presentation. So I'll not be having any disclosures, or and, and, and I'm not going to discuss any off-label medication during this talk. Um, what I'll be uh, doing in the coming 20 to 25 minutes, I'll just uh, be uh, roaming through the definition of hypertension in different populations. And uh, we'll just go through different targets of blood pressure, thresholds and targets of blood pressure in different uh, patients population. And uh, I'll just uh, go quickly through differences in management of, uh, of hypertension management in, in special population compared to general patients with uh, hypertension. During my presentation, I'll be shuffling between these three uh, well-recognized international guidelines, the ACC, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines of 2017, and the uh, European Society of Cardiology, European Society of Hypertension guidelines of 2018, and the latest one, which is the International Society of Hypertension guidelines uh, earlier this year. So uh, um, Professor Bakris have uh, eluded very elegantly on the history of hypertension. So um, as of a couple of years ago, the hypertension definition was some blood pressure of equal or, or more of 140 for systolic readings and or the systolic readings of equal and more or more 90 milliliter, millimeter of mercury. And this is the uh, um, a sort of the final evolution uh, of- Dr. Amin, can I just interrupt, please? Can you have your slide on full screen, please? Thank you. Okay. Show, please. In... So it's showing half slide or the, not a presentation view? 
Yeah, not, please. Can you put it in slideshow? Okay, let me try again. Thank you. Is it better? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. So the, the definition after uh, many years of uh, revolution and evolution, uh, it has reached to a uh, systolic blood pressure of 140 or, or, and the historic blood pressure of 90, equal or more, these two readings. Uh, but it was not as easy as that because the, there were so many co variables that may need or may reduce the threshold of treating those patients. Uh, the first and most important one is which guidelines are we following? And this is what we will be going through during the presentation, that there is um, a major variation between the international guidelines. Um, what's the risk for the cardiovascular risk factor of the patient? So the risk of stratification may increase or reduce the threshold and the target of blood pressure um, control or goal. And uh, the patient's comorbidity, the age of the patient, uh, the blood pressure, whether it's uh, being measured at the office or at home, and which time of the day have we measured this blood pressure. So all these co-variables are important. Probably the age um, will go into depth or, uh, into uh, what's the consideration of age in threshold and the treatment role of hypertension. So the, the, the cardiovascular risk increases quite early uh, with the blood pressure. Uh, what we thought that it's an optimum blood pressure. Uh, in fact, that's the time where the cardiovascular risk or cardiovascular pathophysiology starts. So the cardiovascular risk um, is, may start at as low as the systolic blood pressure of 115 and as low of as low as uh, the systolic blood pressure of 75 millimeter of mercury. Um, the blood pressure cutoff point has been quite dynamically uh, changing in the guidelines as we've mentioned earlier and mentioned uh, by Professor Practice um, a while ago. So uh, this is the, from the JNC uh, guidelines a couple of years ago that showed that any uh, increment of 20 systolic blood pressure points and increment of 10 millimeter of mercury diastolic blood pressure points from the, the benchmark of 115 over 75, the cardiovascular risk almost doubles. So at even at as, as low as a prehypertension state, which is 120 over 80, which we used to call it a quite optimum blood pressure until one uh, less than 140 over 90, this is a prehypertension state, the risk of cardiovascular may be as high as two folds of the general population. And this increases more and more as the blood pressure increases. And here the, the diversion is started between the American College of Cardiology guidelines, or let's call it the American guidelines and the European guidelines, where they, they defined the American guidelines defined the, the blood pressure of the office or clinic blood pressure of equal or more 130 systolic and more equal or more 80 diastolic. While the European remained conservative a little bit, where they, they kept the systolic of 140 equal or more and the diastolic of 90 equal or more. This is what we used to um, uh, adopt in our previous practice. Um, the home blood pressure measurement did not um, push the American guidelines authors to change the, the threshold for treatment. They kept it uh, 130 over 80, while the Europeans, uh, given that the usual readings at home are a bit lower than the stressful environment in the clinic or the office. So they kept it 135 over 85, equal or more for the cell and systolic, uh, respectively. Uh, and this is um, uh, very importantly that we need to measure these blood pressure readings at least two or more careful readings and has to be in two different occasions. So not from the very first time the patient pops into your office and his blood pressure goes in 140 or 145, and we just label him as a high blood pressure or hypertensive patient and we start treatment. Uh, yes, if the blood pressure is more than 160, we may consider that a straightforward uh, pharmacological treatment. And this, uh, we might come uh, to this point later. The differences in, in daytime, day mean blood pressure and the nighttime mean blood pressure and the 24 hour mean blood pressure 
um, this might be quite uh, uh, quite Amin, many. Dr. Amin, sorry to interrupt. Your slides are not moving. Really? Okay. Um, let me try again. Is it the hypertension definition slide? Yes, you can. You can go ahead now. Where do you stop? Okay. So uh, the, um, the the difference between the daytime and the nighttime is uh, just to when the, does the sympathetic and parasympathetic um, system um, um, takes the the dominance. So that during the daytime we get more sympathetic overdrive, so the blood pressure tend to be on the higher side. While the nighttime, the, the parasympathetic will be the dominant one. So the blood pressure goes a little bit lower. So any reading, for example, according to American guidelines if, of uh, systolic blood pressure more than 110 is considered high blood pressure and uh, the patient will be labeled as uh, hypertensive. So this may be a bit confusing, and but it's quite available all uh, across the, the literature and uh, can be easily get, uh, uh, obtained from the internet. And uh, just stressing on what Professor Back is uh, commented on that the, the appropriate um, or proper blood pressure mo monitoring is crucial because from the time we will label the patient as high blood pressure or hypertensive, this will be a lifelong jeopardy and struggle. And uh, even if the blood pressure went down, we will be in the struggle of that uh, Dr. Ala just mentioned, whether to stop the medications and, or, or not. And if yes, how to stop it and where to stop it, when to stop it, and how do we do that? So it's, it's a, a dilemma that we, don't, we do not need it from the start. The, the blood pressure target, so the threshold, we've just mentioned it, 130 over 80, equal or more, uh, Americans, 140 over, over 90, equal or more for um, Europeans. So the target in general for Americans is just less than what they mentioned as threshold of treatment. And the target for the Europeans is less than 140, closer to 130. Uh, this is for all for the general population. And uh, this has been alluded to very nicely by Professor Bakris that they start uh, a single bin, bin, pill combination therapy as early as possible. So um, let's go to, to the more um, um, stratified uh, population that the, who are the special populations that we need to, we may need to manipulate the management a little bit. We'll just uh, go quickly through the older people, the patients with diabetes, patients with renal disease, cardiovascular disease, and a glimpse on patients with pregnancy or pregnant ladies. So um, it's, it has been um, replicated in multiple uh, studies that by the age of 70 years or of, of age, the majority of patients will be having some sort of high blood pressure. And usually it's a systolic blood pressure, not a diastolic one. And the hypertension has been clearly uh, known and labeled as a strong risk factor for cardiovascular disease in elderly. And it's an easy, easily um, manipulatable or easily modifiable cardiovascular risk. Um, as of now, we have uh, quite good or decent number of, of uh, randomized control, control trials that have shown reduction of cardiovascular um, outcomes. Or I'm outcome sorry to interrupt outcomes. again, Dr. Amin, because your slides are not moving. Okay. After the hypertension definition, your slides are not moving. Um, let me try again, just a second. I'm sorry for that. I don't know what's. Uh... You may need to flip it from the screen itself, not from your uh, key keyboard. That might help. Uh, just from screen like this. Um, okay, uh, I'll try. Uh, but it won't give the the right image. But uh, anyway, let's try with that. Is it clear here? Yes, let me, that's fine. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry for this inconvenience. I don't know what's the technical problem. So uh, as of now, we have a, a decent number of randomized controlled trials that showed um, a decent reduction in cardiovascular disease up to age of 80 years old and above. So even at that age, we need to actively treat that blood pressure. 
Concerning the prevalence of blood pressure uh, that increases with age, this is um, um, a very nice uh, a schematic drawing that shows the, the increment from one fold, for example, of blood pressure, systolic or diastolic blood pressure uh, in the third and fourth decade to uh, uh, the increment by four folds when the patient reaches his eighth decade. So the, the prevalence of blood pressure in men uh, at this third decade of life is somewhere between 10 to 15%. That goes to 65% of patients age 75 years, of, uh, uh, 75 years and more uh, males. Um, the female's blood pressure at the younger age is somewhere around 5%. That goes up to 75% of ladies above age of 75 may uh, suffer from the, the sort of systolic or diastolic hypertension. And it's usually systolic, since this is another study that showed the, the predominance of diastolic blood pressure in early age, less than 40 years of, of age. This is the pink part of the bar is the isolated diastolic blood pressure or hypertension. And the yellow part of the bar is the combination of systolic and diastolic. And the light blue uh, part is the isolated systolic. And it's quite clear that the isolated systolic hypertension increases remarkably with age. And at age of 70 and above, we hardly see any patient, or even from 60 and above, we hardly see any patient with isolated diastolic hypertension. And this goes uh, line in line with the pathophysiology of uh, atherosclerosis, stiffness of the cardiovascular, the, the vascular tree, and the stiffness of the myocytes. And, um, Having the blood pressure and older age is the worst combination to have. So this is a five years uh, risk stratification from uh, extraction from Framingham, uh, Framingham study. Uncontrolled blood pressure, which is the, the, the dark red bar, is the uncontrolled blood pressure of 180 uh, average. With, in combination with age more than 60, carries the highest risk of having cardiovascular disease in the coming five years. Um, it's more than the combination of blood pressure and diabetes, blood pressure and gen male gender, blood pressure and dyslipidemia, and blood pressure and cholesterol. And uh, it's worth noticing that the combination of any hypertension with age 60 and above increases the risk of cardiovascular disease almost more than anything else. So um, hypertension and uh, elderly or older people is uh, one of the most essential and important risk factors that you need to tackle um, uh, actively and, and control it uh, onwards. So um, hypertension in older people, the threshold now have come down to 130 over 80. This is American uh, threshold and European threshold is 140 over 90. And the target is uh, for Americans less than 130 over 80, the Europeans closer to 130 over 80. And the initial antihypertensive drug in elderly should generally be started at low dose as possible, the lowest dose possible, and we increase it uh, gradually. And we should not uh, withhold any age, any patient who can tolerate the antihypertensive medications uh, from being well controlled. So uh, as I've just mentioned that we got uh, decent data on patients more than 80 years that showed a reduction in cardiovascular disease outcome or um, uh, jeopardy with um, appropriate control of blood pressure. So uh, in general, the target is less than 130 over 80. Even patients with uh, uh, quite advanced age, they need to be treated and well controlled but uh, we need to weigh the risk and benefit. So the patients who are quite, uh, quite active uh, in dwelling in the community, then we need to um, properly control their blood pressure to the lowest uh, reading possible, which is usually around 130 uh, plus or minus, but uh, we shouldn't go as low as uh, 120. However, from a sprint trial, we, we've got even a better, a good result of favorable outcome with blood pressure readings of 120 over 80. Uh, no randomized control trials have shown a harm um, uh, from going quite low with the, low, with the blood pressure. All the risks that has been documented is basically from the clinical experience and the experts' opinions. 
So um, the choosing medications in this group of patients, we usually go with the general uh, uh, first line therapy, diuretics, AC inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, calcium channel blockers, and beta blockers in the end. And all those medications have shown benefits on cardiovascular outcome among elderly cohorts in different uh, studies. And uh, just to stress on it, start low and move slow with the dose. So summary of the concepts of hypertension in older people, because this is the most important part. Um, the hypertension per se is extremely common in, in patients above 65 years of age. And it's usually systolic more than diastolic. As you, as you mentioned, more than 65 years of age, you can hardly get an isolated diastolic hypertension. And usually it's isolated systolic hypertension on the contrary. And uh, hypertension per se is a major modifiable risk factor targeting general less than 130 over 80 millimeter of mercury. And we need to mind the polypharmacy and uh, the comorbidities of this uh, particular group of patients. And once more, it starts slow and up titrate slowly. So um, moving on to patients with hypertension and diabetes. This again has been touched by the, the Professor Pakris. I have just two slides on that that the, the patients with hypertension at least at least twice as common in patients with type 2 diabetes compared to age-matched non-diabetes individuals. So once again, having, having diabetes increases the likelihood of having hypertension at least twofold in the comparable age-matched um, uh, general population um, um, people. So the active surveillance for the blood pressure in any patient with type 2 diabetes is of paramount importance. Blood pressure should be treated if systolic more than 130, diastolic equal or more 90, and treated to target less than 130 over 80 millimeter of mercury. Um, the blood pressure reduction of less than 130 is uh, very well proven cardioprotective readings for the systolic blood pressure. However, the, the systolic blood pressure reduction less than 120 is still negotiable. Once again, it has been the, the, in the, one of the sub-analyses of ACCORD trial that showed a very favorable cardiovascular outcome uh, going low less than 120, but that was not shown in the, in the initial trial. It was just a post hoc analysis. And uh, the SPRINT trial that, changed, that came and changed all the international guidelines Unfortunately, there, is no, there was no bunch of people with diabetes in that trial. So they were either non-diabetic or the patients with pre-diabetes. So we cannot extrapolate any information in this particular group. Um, in general, um, patients with diabetes, we can choose any first line of therapy unless the patient is having some sort of proteinuria or renal jeopardy, then the RAS blockers has to be the first liners. Patients with diabetes and renal, renal disease, this uh, once again has been touched on it. Blood pressure uh, lowered if the systolic more than 140 over 90, again, European, 130 over 80 or over 90, this is uh, American. And uh, we need to mind that the resistant hypertension is quite common in this group of patients. And this is multifactorial, either hormonal effect or the atherosclerosis effect or renal vascular um, vasculopathy. So uh, we need to um, keep in mind that we may encounter so many patients with um, uh, resistant hypertension in patients with CKD. Treatment strategy usually, in, uh, usually needs to increase the RAS blockers, ACE or, or ARBs, um, plus or minus CCBs or diuretics, um, the, especially if the patient is having, once again, proteinuria. So both CKD and diabetes, if the patient is having proteinuria, then the RAS blockers has to be the first liners. And if the GFR went as low as less than 30, then loop diuretics may play a role in, in treatment of blood pressure in this, in this group. And this is just a schematic drawing that shows the, how to deal with patients with CKD and hypertension. Our goal is less than 130, 80. If the patient is have, uh, doesn't have proteinuria, any sort of proteinuria, then just choose any first line therapy as per your local or international guidelines. If, um, sorry, here we have to very manually remove this. If the patient is having uh, uh, proteinuria, then AC inhibitor uh, 
even out of the RAS blockers, AC inhibitors has the upper hand here in patients with CKD and proteinuria. So if the patient is intolerant to AC inhibitor or it's unavailable, then RAS blockers may play a role. Okay, so uh, patients with cardiovascular disease, it's a broad umbrella, cardiovascular disease. We'll just focus on the cardiovascular uh, uh, coronary artery disease, uh, heart failure, and one or two slides on the ischemic stroke. So um, patients with previous stroke or cardiovascular disease, the blood pressure should be lowered if more than 140 over 90. This for the stable stroke patient. For the cardio, uh, coronary artery disease, it goes again as 130 over 90. Heart failure patients, um, we need to treat if the blood pressure is 140 over 90. Target is 130 over 80. But we do not need to reduce the blood pressure as low, uh, lower than 120 over 70. This is, again, is a debatable area or a debatable figure cutoff point. Once again, the game changer, the sprint guidelines, sprint trial have shown 25% uh, extra cardio protection or uh, reduction in mortality in patients with heart failure when they, the, they reduce the blood pressure less than 120. But uh, this has to be uh, dealt with with caution and uh, in uh, expert hands. Um, blood pressure should be lowered uh, uh, to just uh, around 130 over 90, over 80, I'm sorry. And RAS blockers, beta blockers, irrespective to blood pressure uh, with or without calcium channel blockers are the first line. So in, in those patients, part of the cardiac remodeling um, process and uh, the um, prevention of cardio, cardiac myocytes, uh, death and damage, so RAS blockers, beta blockers have shown reduction in mortality and uh, worsening of the cardiac status in patients with, uh, with coronary artery disease. So regardless the patient is hypertensive or not, we may consider giving any RAS blocker or uh, cardioselective beta blocker. Patients with uh, stable ischemic, uh, ischemic uh, heart disease, the target is less than 130 over 80. And once again, AC inhibitors plus uh, beta blockers, if not controlled, we can go to uh, CCP. And for the sake of the time, we'll just skip uh, the details. And uh, hypertension and heart failure. I'll just bring this up. So hypertension and heart failure. So uh, the, one of the, the, the frequently used terminology nowadays is the heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, HEFPEF, and the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which is HEFPEF. Ejection fraction less than 40 in this category and ejection fraction more than 50 in this category. So as it's well shown and described here in this schematic drawing, that the, 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 the stolic dysfunction in the heart failure uh, with preserved ejection fraction, we, get, we tend to get uh, um, hypertrophy of the cardiac myocyte of the left ventricle and uh, um, narrowing of the ventricular uh, uh, cavity and uh, the increment of the um, atrial, left atrial uh, cavity. While in the systolic uh, dysfunction, which uh, systolic dysfunction, sorry, and the heart failure with uh, reduced ejection fraction, we tend to get thinning of the cardiac myocytes or the cardiac wall and uh, enlargement of the left ventricular cavity and a sort of enlargement of the left atrial cavity. So the general terms, this is the mainly systolic dysfunction and this is mainly the systolic dysfunction. And this, the, the HEFREF is the most, uh, more commonly presented in, in clinical practice and the patient will be complaining of it. So uh, hypertension with HEFREF target less than 130 over 80, there is no difference. Um, the treatment should include diuretics, uh, RAS blockers, and beta blockers. We need to avoid calcium channel blockers in this particular uh, group of patients. And now the emerging game changer, the SGLT tools in management of heart failure. So this has been now um, uh, advancing in non-diabetic heart failure uh, patients. Uh, we got over the last couple of months, multiple uh, studies that have shown the, the beneficial effect of SGLT2 in heart failure patients with and without diabetes. So probably this may play a role in the, in the future uh, guidelines. The heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the patient doesn't have lots of uh, fluid overload. So this is why here the diuretics may be needed or may not. Otherwise the patient has to be on RAS blockers and beta blockers.
Um, hypertension in a stable stroke. Patient with, who's already been uh, stable more than three days uh, post initial stroke, then the blood pressure has to be managed as just uh, a patient with hypertension and old stroke. So the threshold here is 140 over 90. Even the ACC have agreed on that because there is no beneficial, uh, there is no evidence that reducing the blood pressure less than this will be of benefit. So uh, in this particular patient, the, the patient with stable stroke, the threshold for blood pressure lowering is 140 over 90, not 130 over 80, over 90 like the rest of the ACC patients. And the target goes down to 130 over 80. And once again, pass blockers, the thiazide diuretics or combination is highly needed. So if the patient is, uh, have, is previously known to, after three days of uh, previous TIA or stroke, patient known to have hypertension, go back to his previous medication. Sorry, again, I have to remove this manually. Uh, if the patient doesn't, uh, has not been known to be uh, having high blood pressure and his systolic remained more than 140, the systolic remained equal or more than uh, 90, then start treatment. If the blood pressure after the stroke went down less than 140 over 90, and just uh, to remind you again, this is one of the two groups out of all ACC um, uh, categories that the threshold of treatment is less than 140 over 90, not 130 over 90, like what we said earlier. So uh, here, if the blood pressure is this in, in this uh, range, then usefulness of starting antihypertensive treatment is not well established. Okay, so the last uh, group, um, the hypertension and uh, pregnant ladies, just a couple of definitions. Uh, it's been quite a while that we've uh, uh, discussed uh, any pregnancy related issues. The, the definition of pre-existing hypertension is the hypertension that starts before pregnancy or less than 20 weeks of gestation. So any blood pressure that has been, hypertension has been diagnosed at uh, the early, the first trimester, trimester and early second trimester, this is usually a pre-existing hypertension that was not diagnosed before. And any hypertension that lasts more than six months, after, six weeks after, after delivery. So once again, this is not um, hormonal related or the pregnancy related uh, blood pressure that um, most likely will continue. And so this is a pre-existing uh, or essential hypertension. Gestation hypertension is between these two readings, any blood pressure between 20 weeks of gestation and less than six weeks of postpartum, uh, that's the gestational hypertension. Again, manually, sorry for that. Um, preeclampsia and eclampsia, we all know that preeclampsia is hypertension with proteinuria and eclampsia is hypertension in pregnancy with any on end organ damage, including severe headache, uh, seizure, renal impairment, uh, um, severe GI symptoms and heart uh, sequelae. Um, uh, any lady uh, who's uh, planning to get pregnant and she's known to be hypertensive, she has to be transitioned to a safer medication that is methyl dopa, nifedipine, or labetalol. Usually methyl dopa is the first line therapy, one of the safest and one of the, the oldest medications in, in, the, in the hypertension and pregnancy paradigm. Women with hypertension who become pregnant should not be treated with ACE or ARPS or direct renin inhibitors. Those have shown uh, the devastating um, fetal uh, um, anomalies, so they are completely contraindicated, RAS blockers and renin inhibitors. So in two slides, just to summarize, the loads of numbers and the categorizations, um, the ACC uh, special population targets as you have just mentioned, patient with secondary pre uh, stroke prevention, the threshold will be 140 over 90, equal or more. And any patient with just hypertension, nothing else, there is no risk of future cardiovascular disease or, or the, the risk is less than 10%. So those two categories are having, um, there is no evidence that uh, starting blood, uh, pharmacological treatment at the blood pressure less than 140 will be having a, um, a favorable outcome in future. Otherwise, any patient with future cardiovascular risk more than 10, any older people, uh, older patient more than 65 years of age, other categories that we have just mentioned, the cutoff point will be 130 over 80, equal or more systolic or diastolic respectively. And the goal generally will be just grabbing it less than these two graphs. Uh, 
Um, once again, Professor Bakris have uh, alluded on this just to um, uh, just to stress on it again. The the European guidelines and American guidelines have more or less came closer in in diabetes group, coronary artery disease group, and post stroke group. So the 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 um, Europeans they tend to um, get the blood pressure down to the target of blood pressure down to 130, just around 130. Don't go far below that. And uh, Professor Backus have shown that uh, uh, in red that do not go less than 120. So still the European guidelines are pre uh, conservative in this uh, particular part, while Americans uh, American guidelines have shown just go as much as the patient tolerates with the blood pressure, systolic or diastolic, less than 130 over 80, respectively. So ladies and gentlemen, let, uh, please allow me to conclude that uh, with the statements that hypertension in the special population modestly varies from patients with isolated simple hypertension. Target of treatment is generally 100, less than 130 systolic, less than 80 diastolic millimeter of mercury, sorry for typos. And pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatment is equally important from the time of diagnosis of blood pressure. Older people, even up to 80 years of age, may benefit from reducing blood pressure um, around 130 over 80 or below. And medicine selection is crucial in different patients' profile. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much and uh, apologize for the technical uh, faults in the presentation. Uh, many thanks, Dr. Amin, for the excellent presentations. And uh, I just want to remind the attendee, uh, currently we have 735 attendees with us. Uh, if you have any question, please type it in the icon for the Q&A and we'll be taking it after the last session. Uh, and uh, I would like now to introduce our uh, speaker, Professor Melanie Davis, who was with us in the last uh, webinar. Professor Melanie uh, is a professor of diabetes medicine at University of Leicester and the honorary consultant diabetology at the University Hospital of Leicester, uh, NHS Trust. Uh, she's the co-director of Leicester Diabetes Center, University Hospital, and she's the co-chair of ESD ADA consensus report on type 2 diabetes uh, management. Uh, Professor Melanie will be covering today the management of diabetes in patients with cardiovascular disease. Uh, Prof, the floor is yours. Please unmute your mic and share your screen. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I'll just hopefully be able to share my slides with you. Can you see my slides? Yes, Prof. Okay, and I just want to check that they're advancing okay. Is that right? Yes, it is indeed. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much, Dr. Alawadi. Uh, it's um, a great pleasure to be presenting to you in these strange times. I, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, um, but it's great to have uh, this network opportunity. So I'm, I'm going to slightly go off brief because I'm going to talk about uh, the management in patients with cardiovascular disease, but I thought I would give a slightly broader picture of the management of people uh, with diabetes, um, not just those with cardiovascular disease, because of course all of our patients are, are much higher cardiovascular risk and sometimes it's difficult uh, to pick out those people with established disease and those that, that, that don't. Um, I want to start talking about the ADA ESD consensus, which has been around for uh, um, 16 years now, the first consensus, which was working with the ADA and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes. And that really focused around glucose and it focused around the glucose lowering agents, particularly metformin SUs and insulin. Now, in the last 15 years, the management of diabetes has changed uh, hugely. And by 2012, we already had the incretin-based therapy. So the incretin enhancers, the DPP-4 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And the algorithm for glucose lowering was really around healthy eating and lifestyle metformin and then what we added after metformin. And even up until 2015, that hadn't changed hugely, uh, apart from the fact that we had a very important group of drugs uh, called the SGLT2 inhibitors, which uh, also now were included in that algorithm. 
So when we uh, looked at the update in 20, at the end of 2018, we, um, it before had been quite an, an expert consensus and we felt that we had to look at the evidence much more because there'd been a huge shift in the evidence. There's a much fo greater focus on lifestyle interventions. We've heard in the previous talk about the importance of lifestyle interventions in the management of hypertension, and that's the same in diabetes. And we really had a focus on weight loss and obesity management, including a, uh, metabolic surgery. There's a greater focus on uh, patient self-management, which I'll briefly mention, and also on therapeutic inertia and uh, continuing to support patients in taking their medicines. And of course, um, what I will talk about is the preferred choice of glucose lowering agents, particularly driven by the new evidence from the cardiovascular outcome studies. And I'll talk briefly about that. So this is this decision cycle. Um, and I think there's a really a couple of things to note. Firstly, that the patient or the person with diabetes sits right center and front in all of our uh, decisions around management, you know, so the person with diabetes should be at the center of everything. And our aim is not um, now around just lowering A1C, it's to put in place um, uh, management that prevents and reduces the burden of complications, both micro and macrovascular complications, but also optimizes um, the person living with diabetes quality of life. And we uh, um, propose that that should start with um, an assessment of the key characteristics, including comorbidities and uh, depression and cultural and socioeconomic circumstances. We should consider specific factors which impact on the choice of treatment, including hypoglycemia, weight, cost of, of treatments and access to treatments that we should uh, have shared decision-making to uh, create a management plan, which I'll briefly talk about. And that once we agree with the person with diabetes, we should implement that plan, but it should be uh, subject to ongoing monitoring and support and review. And the reason that we, we, we talk about this person-centered care is that people with diabetes live with multiple uh, chronic conditions that we as healthcare providers need to be uh, empathetic and deliver individualized patient-centered care because uh, what may be best for each individual person needs to take into account their social and, and, and personal context, their values, but also um, the contribution of options that we may consider and also the cost and the access uh, that is available. So shared decision making uh, involves a sharing. So it, it's about taking into account the, the preferences and the choices of that person. It involves having somebody that is informed about those choices um, and seeks their preference and uh, ensures that there's an effective consultation which puts the patient uh, and empowers the patient and ensures they have access uh, to um, self-management. And shared decision making can improve the quality of the decisions that are made. And in 2020, it's an ethical imperative that we support patients to be able to manage uh, their condition uh, in a more autonomous way. Patient self-management is really central to all of this. So, for example, in diabetes, there are a number of evidence based programs now either delivered individually or in groups that promotes a healthy lifestyle, but also support medication taking behavior, increase self-efficacy, and have as much evidence now as some of the medications in terms of reducing A1C, reducing long-term outcomes, um, being cost-effective. And there are now a number of systematic reviews and meta-analyses that show that these reduce uh, the risk of all-cause mortality. So this is an important intervention. When it comes to the glucose lowering medication, so that's the choice of the glucose lowering medication is one aspect of this. Um, the algorithm we put into place, um, we continue to recommend metformin as the foundational treatment and we can discuss that. But then it should be based, uh, what to add to metformin should be based on patient preference, clinical characteristics, and we called out a number of different uh, scenarios, one being 
the presence of established or very high risk atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or heart failure or chronic kidney disease. And we'll come back to that. But also in the absence of, of, of those factors, things like hypoglycemia, weight gain, and of course the cost and access of treatments. And so this is the ADA ESD algorithm for the choice of glucose lowering medication. As we said, metformin is still considered first line and comprehensive lifestyle, including weight management and physical activity. Um, in those with established ASCVD, chronic kidney disease or heart failure, there's a particular algorithm um, around the preferred use of um, cardioprotective treatments, which I'll come back to briefly. Um, however, in those without very high risk factors or established disease, then we think about these different scenarios. So for example, is there a compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia? Is that one of the things that you as the healthcare professional and the patient really has as a priority? Or is it, for example, weight, uh, minimizing weight gain or promoting weight loss? Or is cost a major factor? And, and in some uh, healthcare economies, uh, cost uh, is uh, one of the main things. So when we're talking about glucose lowering medication uh, in those in which there's a compelling need to minimize hypoglycemia, uh, we talk about trying to identify those risk groups that are at the highest risk and making sure that we set appropriate individualized targets, that we use the principle set out in this decision cycle um, and that these patients have access to self-management support um, and that we choose glucose lowering uh, agents that when added to metformin have the lowest risk of hypoglycemia. And essentially the DPP-4 inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor analogs, the SGLT2s and the TZ TZDs all have a very low risk of hypoglycemia. Obviously they differ in cost, uh, whether they're injectable or oral, or whether they um, are weight neutral or weight losing or weight gaining. But if the hypos are the predominant factor, then these are the agents added to metformin that have the lowest risk. Um, in, in those in which you're, we're trying to improve glycemic control, but we're trying to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss, then we need to be sure that we're implementing strat strategies for maximizing weight loss. And that may be around lifestyle advice. Uh, it may be around pharmacotherapy. It may be around the non-surgical energy restricted diets. And I'll talk briefly about those, or it may even be around uh, metabolic surgery. So if we look at, um, you know, there are a number of studies now that show that there is evidence, uh, particularly in people um, uh, shortly after diagnosis that uh, energy low energy diets can actually uh, put patients with diabetes into remission. We have evidence from the direct study, which is a UK study, but also uh, studies like Diadem, uh, which was similar in direct, but, but obviously in a Middle Eastern and North African population. So there's a, a good evidence base now, I think, in, in those uh, groups. Um, this, uh, as you know, was delivered by a dietary replacement phase of 12 weeks with um, complete dietary replacement, a food introduction uh, phase over the next six weeks, and then a weight maintenance phase when there was an individually tailored energy prescription uh, to um, improve, uh, to prevent rate, weight regain. Um, and this study, this is the direct study that was published in the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. This is the two year uh, follow up data that you can see by one year, um, uh, around a quarter of uh, patients were able to achieve 15 kilogram weight loss by two years that had dropped to 11 percent, um, that there was a, a significant increase, uh, that a significant number of patients uh, achieving remission of diabetes. Um, again, uh, very uh, reasonably impressive at one year, had dropped a little uh, at two years. And then if you look at the percentage of patients achieving remission in those people that had achieved um, 15 kilogram weight loss, uh, or, um, then uh, those patients did incredibly well. So the majority of patients who were able to achieve um, around about a 15% weight loss, which in this study was around 15 kilograms, um, then the majority of those patients go into remission. So 
if you look at the uh, the number of patients eligible to the number of people achieving remission at two years, it's a relatively small proportion of patients, and it does relate to those uh, patients uh, closer to uh, shorter duration of diabetes, but this is an option in some patients. In terms of general intensive lifestyle intervention, the look ahead study was a little disappointing. Um, it was possible for patients to achieve e at least a, um, a partial remission, but it was the minority of patients. And as you know, this study didn't lead uh, to reduce cardiovascular outcomes, but diet and lifestyle interventions are important, but they may not um, be the only answer. Bariatric surgery, um, I think, is still in, in some areas uh, an important intervention. It um, undoubtedly uh, has the most uh, profound evidence in terms of weight loss. So in this meta-analysis, in over 20,000 patients, the weight loss was around 60% and three quarters of patients were able to achieve complete resolution of diabetes. So this is a powerful uh, treatment, but of course it's not um, uh, available to all of our patients with diabetes. And even if we uh, look at uh, the Swedish obesity survey where they looked at long-term follow-up of bariatric surgery, this was in a cohort of people with diabetes at baseline. If you look at the, uh, the long-term outcomes, um, you can see uh, that in terms of remission, um, whilst there was relatively high remission rate rates with surgery at two years at 70%, that had dropped to under 40% by 10 year follow up and by 15 year follow up had dropped um, even further. So even bariatric surgery in the longer term is not um, a complete cure for, for diabetes. If we look at that um, by the duration of diabetes at baseline, if, you're, if you have your bari bariatric surgery within one year of diagnosis, you can see your chance of, of going into remission um, is much greater uh, in that light green bar, which are the people with a short duration of diabetes compared to the dark green bar with people with diabetes of over four years. So if we're going to use either low energy diets or bariatric surgery, uh, we need to be using them very early in the diabetes diagnosis for them to be uh, really effective. And um, if we look at what that has in terms of long term preventing long term complications, um, there's evidence that that reduces the burden of microvascular complications. So you can see the hazard ratio of 0.44 in the patients um, in the surgical group compared to control. If you look at macrovascular complications, uh, there's a 32% reduction, um, and that is significant. Now, if you if you take out those little subgroups um, and look in uh, people with diabetes duration at baseline, you can see it's pretty effective. A 45% reduction in in a in a pooling of both micro and macrovascular complications in those people who are diagnosed um, or and had their bariatric surgery within a year. It's um, uh, still significant if you uh, look at it within a duration of one to three years. But if your bariatric surgery is done after you've had diabetes for more than four years, then there's not a significant impact on reducing the burden of complications. So really um, bariatric surgery is a very effective weight losing therapy for patients with diabetes, but the long-term benefits and impacts on, on complications are much uh, less if it's delivered later. Um, so we need to think about that. So bariatric surgery in people with diabetes around 30 to 60% will go into remission. Um, but even in those patients who go in initially into remission, they will later, their diabetes will often come back later. And the predictor of poor remission rates, as I've said, is duration of diabetes, but also age, if you're aged over 50, and if your baseline A1C is higher, um, and also if you're on more glucose lowering agents. Now, what about the choice of glucose lowering therapies? If uh, we want to try and uh, control A1C and improve glycemic management, but minimize weight gain uh, over and above the other interventions I've just talked about, 
Uh, we have two classes of drugs which are essentially weight losing, uh, the GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s. Within the class of GLP-1, there's marked heterogeneity across the class uh, in terms of uh, impact on weight, uh, with, uh, for example, semaglutide being much more effective in terms of weight loss um, compared to other agents, for example, lixizenotide. So these are the two classes uh, uh, for A1C um, lowering and good impact on weight. And of course, the combination of these two classes uh, is also being uh, looked at. And this is a, a meta-analysis that was published uh, in uh, the end of last year, which looks, uh, there's only a few studies, but there are an increasing number now. So we've got the award 10 program, um, duration eight, sustain nine, where different combinations of GLP-1s have been examined in uh, combination with an SGLT-2. Uh, just to point out in the top panel, uh, you're looking at um, impact um, in terms of uh, uh, HbA1c, and you can see uh, that uh, there's a, a little bit of heterogeneity in that the combination of semaglutide with an SGLT2 has got the greatest um, uh, A1C lowering. If you look at panel B, which is body weight, uh, again, it's the uh, semaglutide combination which seems to be the most efficacious, although uh, there is benefit with the other combinations. And uh, in uh, the bottom panel, it's systolic blood pressure where also this combination seems to have um, some benefit. So that's uh, what about intensifying to injectable therapies? And I think this is a busy slide and I don't expect you to read the detail, but I think it's really important that we think about uh, injectable therapies in type two diabetes um, and think about where insulin fits, where the GLP-1s fit and where the combinations fit. Um, and also the combination of oral therapies in combination with injectable treatment. So we said that you really should continue on an SGLT2 when you move to injectable therapy, either insulin or a GLP-1. Um, and you do need to be careful, however, about instructing on sick day rules and not uh, down titrating insulin over aggressively because that can lead to euglycemic DKA that we should, in the majority of patients, unless there's a contraindication, continue with metformin, that we should stop a DPP-4 if we're moving to a GLP-1. It's perfectly fine to continue in combination with insulin, but there's absolutely no benefit of using DPP-4s with GLP-1s. That we should consider stopping a sulfonylurea, particularly if we're moving to more intensive uh, insulin regimes, such as premix or basal bolus, and also particularly TZDs with insulin, particularly when we get to more complex insulin regimes, there's quite marked weight gain of that combination. With injectable therapy, we talked um, about um, in the majority of patients with type 2 diabetes, the first injectable, if there's access and cost, is not so much of an issue as is a GLP-1. And I'll come back to the reason for that. But you may consider insulin as the first injectable, particularly if the A1C is high, if there's um, an index of suspicion for type 1 diabetes or there's marked symptoms of catabolism. And in those people with A1Cs, particularly above 10 and possibly even um, a lower A1C, that the initial uh, combination of a GLP-1 and insulin uh, should be uh, used. Um, and particularly now we have fixed ratio combinations that we can use. So um, the reason that we talked um, about um, uh, a GLP-1 being preferred in most patients is that there's quite a, an evidence base for that now. And I've already uh, said about uh, insulin in some patients and this uh, initial combination of basal insulin with a GLP-1. So GLP-1s, um, as I've said, uh, should be considered as the first choice uh, for patients who need the greater glucose lowering effect of an injectable medication, because when we reviewed the evidence, there's a substantial evidence now supporting uh, equal or uh, greater A1C lowering with GLP-1s comparable to uh, uh, insulin, but an advantage in terms of weight um, and also an advantage in terms of a low risk of hypoglycemia. Right. 
Also, we talk about uh, the combination of basal insulin and GLP-1 because of the marked um, complementary, uh, uh, that they complement um, each other in terms of mechanism of action um, uh, in tackling the pathophysiology that we see in type 2 diabetes. So uh, particularly in terms of uh, the GLP-1s addressing uh, reducing energy intake, um, uh, uh, and inhibiting gastric emptying in some of the agents, but also uh, tackling um, uh, glucose-dependent insulin secretion, uh, whereas uh, obviously basal insulin will also have an impact in terms of reducing hepatic glucose production. So when it comes to more intensive insulin regimes, if a patient is already on a GLP-1 and not getting to target, we talk about the addition of basal insulin or vice versa, if a patient's on basal insulin and we need to intensify their regime, we talk about this combination now of a GLP-1 and basal insulin, not necessarily moving to premix insulin and basal bolus because there's a lot of evidence in type two of the benefit of this combination. And also we have now fixed ratio combinations where a single injection combines uh, a GLP-1 and basal insulin. Um, the other, uh, however, in some patients, we will need to move to more complex insulin regimes, and we can do that either with adding a basal plus, where we add prandial insulin, uh, firstly to the late largest meal, and then go, moving more towards a basal bolus regime, or with the use of premixed insulins. But I think increasingly in the management of type 2 diabetes, we're seeing less patients on full basal bolus or premixed insulin because we have better combinations of oral agents, for example, SGLT2s, DPP4s in combination with insulin, but also we have this powerful combination of GLP-1 uh, with basal insulin um, as well. Now, what about new data um, uh, since the original 2018 ADA ESD guidelines? Just to give you some headlines, um, the positioning of DPP-4 inhibitors. I think the Carolina study was a really important study. It was a head-to-head -head, uh, with the sulfonylurea. It was very reassuring, I think, from the SU point of view in that there didn't appear to be any increase in cardiovascular harm with sulfonylureas compared to DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, it did tell us what we know, I think, about the risk of hypoglycemia and that uh, SUs do increase the risk of hypoglycemia and DPP-4s reduce the risk, but this wasn't translating into cardiovascular harm. Um, and I think that's an important um, finding, particularly in countries where it, 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 access to SUs is, is really their, and metformin is really their only, their only option. The VERIFY study showed us um, that it's uh, the importance of early combination treatment, and in this case with metformin and a DPP-4 inhibitor, and how uh, that can reduce uh, subsequent treatment failure. So this earlier combination use uh, is important. Um, and um, uh, I suppose what we don't know is, uh, it, it, we've, we've seen that in one study, so we don't know whether other combinations would be better in this regard than the combination that was studied, which was with a particular DPP-4, Vildaglitin, and was with DPP-4s and metformin. In terms of the cardiovascular outcome studies, um, I think this is a good slide to uh, summarize where we are with the SGLT2. So this is um, uh, a slide from a couple of weeks ago. I chaired the session at uh, the ESD around Vertis. And in the discussion, this was a slide presented by Darren Maguire, where this looks at the uh, a meta analysis, a new meta analysis where we're able to include Vertis CV. So here you can see um, in patients at the top of the panel with established ASCVD. Um, from Empereg, Canvas, Declare, Credence, and Vertis CV. And you can see overall um, that the across the um, SGL22 class, there's a 0.89, uh, so a, a, a reduction of 11%, uh, which is uh, statistically significant. But you can see the I2, the heterogeneity, there is a little bit of heterogeneity across the study. So for example, 
Uh, there's a 14% reduction in MPREG, which on its own is significant, whereas Virtus, which had virtually similar patients uh, with most than the MPREG, showed really no signal of a reduction in, in, in three-point MACE with a, a hazard ratio of 0.99. However, what we do see in the patients with no uh, ASCVD, um, there really isn't an impact. The only impact is in credence. And of course, those were patients with chronic kidney disease. So really the message is in terms of reducing a three-point MACE or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, there's a benefit in people with established disease with, um, with SGLT2s, although there is surprisingly some heterogeneity across the class uh, the data we see with empafaglosin and canafaglosin, and to a certain extent dapafaglosin, we really don't see uh, with ertafaglosin. Um, if we look at time to, cardi to cardiovascular death, again, if we look um, uh, across the class, the, the, the hazard ratio is 0.85, but if you look at the heterogeneity it's 64%, so there's much more heterogeneity across the studies. And you can see just by eyeballing it that really it's empareg with empafaglosin that's sort of providing most of the evidence for a reduction in cardiovascular death, which is reflected in the label uh, for empafaglosin. And there's really no signal uh, in Virtus. However, if we look at heart failure, here we see a much more um, clearer um, consistency across the study. So hazard ratios of, of 0.65 to 0.7 virtually in all the studies and look at that I squared. So here there's no, um, there's zero heterogeneity. So the studies are pretty consistent and we really don't see any difference across the different agents. And that just shows the heart failure studies a bit more pictorially. We also know now, um, even in patients without diabetes, this is DAPA heart failure. Um, this was a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that in patients with and without diabetes, that this primary composite of heart failure um, and cardiovascular death was reduced by 26%, that cardiovascular death was reduced by 18%, and it was a significant reduction and there was really no difference in the subgroup with or without diabetes. That, and that will be uh, changing the way that we use SGLT2's inhibitors. In terms of chronic kidney disease, um, this shows the data before the ertafaglosin study. But um, here we see across the class a meta-analysis that shows reduction in hard renal endpoints. So a 33% uh, reduction in a dialysis, transplantation, or end-stage renal disease, um, a 25% reduction in end-stage kidney disease, and a 25% reduction in acute kidney injury. So really uh, pretty good data uh, with the SGLT2s. Uh, Virtus, at first glance, seems to be a bit disappointing, and it probably is. So you you know, and if you choose a primary endpoint, um, you have to uh, stick to the end. Well, this, sorry, not a primary endpoint, but this is the endpoint that they chose for kidney composite outcomes, which was a doubling of serum creatinine, dialysis or death. And it didn't reach statistical significance in the uh, Virtus CTV study. If you use the same definition across all of the studies, uh, which is this sustained 40% reduction in EGFR, renal replacement therapy, or death, then you see much more um, consistency with the results with the SGLT2. So I think there seems to be clear consistency of the results in terms of chronic kidney disease protection and heart failure, um, but some difference across the class in terms of cardiovascular death and impact on, on MACE. Very briefly, uh, the GLP-1s, um, there's much more heterogeneity across the class in these molecules. Um, uh, I showed you that for weight. Uh, these are very quite different molecules. Some of them are exendin-based, some of them are macromolecular, uh, some of them are GLP-1 uh, human analogs, uh, isolated uh, analogs such as uh, semaglutide and liragutide. Uh, about half the studies showed a positive endpoint in MACE, so liragutide, semaglutide, albiglutide, and dulaglutide, 
all showed reduction in MACE. Uh, Pioneer with oral semaglutide is a little bit unusual because it was only a 16 month study in a very small number. So the hazard ratio was in the right direction, uh, but it wasn't a significant reduction. Um, really only liragutide was powered, to, uh, uh, shows significantly a reduction in cardiovascular death. Um, again, oral semaglutide showed quite an impressive result, but it was not powered uh, to show, uh, and we can't apply a p-value to that hazard ratio. If we look at, so, so fairly convincing data with some of the agents in terms of MACE, um, and even in people with multiple risk factors from, uh, the, from the Rewind trial. But if we look at the renal endpoints, although the composite renal endpoint was reduced, it was pretty much explained by a, a reduction in proteinuria. So you don't see the impact on the really hard renal endpoints that you see with the SGLT2s. But you can use um, uh, the, and, and that was similar uh, to rewind with uh, dulaglutide uh, to a certain extent. Um, there really wasn't a significant reduction in these harder renal endpoints. But of course, these are kidney friendly drugs. They can be used down to a low EGFR, um, down to 15, for example. Um, and they are having some impact on that renal uh, composite, although it's largely driven by reduction in proteinuria. So what did we say um, at the ADA ESD around uh, based on this, uh, this new evidence? So we amended our initial guidance to talk about that in, in, in patients at high risk or with established disease that we should be using these agents uh, independent of, of baseline A1C or individualized A1C target. We should use them we should add them in rewind. There was no lower limit of A1C for patients to be recruited into these studies. And that there is maybe a case for using earlier combination, uh, but we didn't feel there was sufficient evidence uh, to promote that in all patients. In terms of the GLP-1s, the consensus is that there's slightly greater evidence uh, for GLP-1s where MACE is the, is the greatest, the gravest threat. So, uh, in terms of uh, MI or stroke or peripheral arterial disease, then the GLP-1s uh, have um, uh, the, the, best, the better evidence. And because of the uh, rewind data, we also included those patients with subclinical disease, uh, which were picked out in that study, such as left ventricular hypertrophy and also 50% uh, um, stenosis in coronary carotid or peripheral arteries. With the SGLT2, we've gone a little bit further now, both in terms of uh, HEF-REF and also in uh, recommending the use to prevent progression of chronic kidney disease, particularly in those patients uh, with uh, EGFRs between 30 and 60 and high UACRs, but also uh, even in those patients with microalbuminuria. And I think um, reassuring data about the risk of amputation has come uh, through the Credence study. So this is the algorithm now. So the, the pink uh, uh, wording highlights the difference from the original um, consensus. So we, we talk about the importance of adding uh, independent of A1C. And now uh, where ASCVD predominates, it's preference given to a GLP-1, um, whereas with heart failure or chronic kidney disease, it's preference for the SGLT2s. Uh, and that's... Um, highlighted a little bit more um, on this slide. Now, I just want to end with a bit of a reality check because, you know, this the ADA ESD consensus talks about that. The European Society of Cardiology advocates early use of, of these drugs, and yet they're not very widely used. So if we just look at the SGLT2s, uh, this was data uh, that came out um, in 2019 in over a million adults in the US, where only seven and a half percent of patients were initiated uh, with type 2 diabetes on an SGLT2. And actually, you were less likely to be initiated on an SGLT2 if you had chronic kidney disease, heart failure, or an MI. So not only are we barely using these treatments, we're not using them uh, in the patients who are most likely to benefit. 
So type two diabetes uh, management is, is uh, advancing rapidly and becoming increasingly complex. Therapeutic inertia and medic medication persistent are major issues. Pa uh, patient centered care is really important and that the foundational use of metformin I think is still important, but then early addition of other medications are dependent on comorbidities. And if a patient's on metformin, regardless of their A1C and they have established ASCVD, chronic kidney disease or heart failure, we should be adding these agents really early. The advent of positive cardiovascular outcome trials has prioritized the use of GLP-1s and SGLT2s in recent guidelines, but there is some heterogeneity within the class um, about their label and about some of the nuances of where they uh, have particular benefits. And we need to be aware of these differences uh, when selecting treatments. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Melanie, for the, um, for the excellent talk as usual. It's always a pleasure hearing you. And uh, I will start first of you with, your, uh, with the first question. And um, what is the effect of the SGLT on a heart failure? Does it fade with time? Um, so we've no reason to think uh, that it would fade with time. Um, we don't really know the answer to that question. I mean, these, this first emerged through Empereg when it was a secondary outcome and there was very little data around echoes and the type of heart failure that we were impacting on. Even in people without um, heart failure at diagnosis, there appeared to be a benefit in reducing heart failure. With um, the, um, uh, the latest uh, DECLARE study, we had a bit more data around patients who had ECHO, and it appeared to be particularly uh, beneficial in people with reduced ejection fraction heart failure. And we now know with EMPERA reduced and with um, DAPA HF, that if you recruit people with reduced ejection fraction heart failure, that we uh, improve outcomes we don't know how much that goes over the very long term, but over the oh sorry, but over the 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 um, duration of those studies, those benefits seem to be lasting. I think you know how long those those uh, benefits last for. Uh, it's not completely clear. The, you know we've got data out to four or five years with with the um, uh, with uh, the uh, Empereg study, and in the real world evidence study that we've got some uh, benefit. The unanswered questions, I think, are preser uh, preserved ejection fraction heart failure. We haven't seen that data yet um, with the with the SGLT twos. Um, so, but but I think it, there's no reason to think that it should only be for short duration that these agents work. Sure, thank you. The other question: How can you explain the latest result of ertagliflozin compared to other SGLT two? Yeah, I think it's a really uh, you know, really difficult question. And um, so, you know, I think the I think the kidney and the heart failure data looks more the same. Actually, if you if you look like for like, the heart failure data looks pretty similar. And I think they just chose the wrong composite endpoint for renal outcomes. The cardiovascular death and the MACE is a little bit more difficult to explain because it doesn't, you know, if you look at the inclusion criteria and you look at the uh, baseline characteristics. The A1C was pretty similar. Uh, the use of cardioprotective agents wasn't that different, even though it's a slightly more up-to-date study. There was a higher proportion of patients with heart failure in that study. It was about 24% compared to only about 12% in Empereg and, and, and in the others. But I'm not sure it is. It, it, it's so easy to explain, and I've not seen anybody come up with a completely credible explanation of why it should be different apart from the fact that the agent is a bit different and not so effective. Right. One more question for you, uh, Professor Meli. Uh, what about the emperor was not significant, but the DAPA heart failure, it was significant. So what was the reason? No, I don't think that's true. I think if you look at emperor reduce the data for the outcome was pretty similar to what we see with DAPA HF. So my understanding of, of the data and the, the data that I've seen is that the, the, the results are fairly similar actually, and that they both achieved uh, their primary endpoint and 
um, uh, so if you can sh show me any different to that, uh, that's fine. But that's my understanding of the emperor reduced um, data that we've seen. Okay, this is another question to you as well. Uh, we make a good use of you, Professor Melanie. You've been with us here all the way from UK. So uh, what is your opinion? What do you think, uh, considering looking at the pharmacological intervention to prevent diabetes, especially in a person uh, in the presence of a drug that can prevent diabetes by more than 70% greater than bariatric surgery? And the example for that, the TZTs. Yeah, I mean, yes, but the study that looked at this was the DREAM study, and the DREAM study turned into a bit of a nightmare study, because actually, although you were able to prevent uh, diabetes, you did it at the expense of increasing heart failure and overall uh, uh, no reduction in mortality. So, you know, the TZ, TZDs, I think, you know, have been looked at both in gestational diabetes and as a prevention for diabetes, but they're not cost effective and the overall risk benefit to the patient is not, um, is not good. If you look at prevention of diabetes, by far the best evidence is actually in, in good old fashioned lifestyle interventions, the diabetes prevention study and the Finnish diabetes prevention study. It's just, you know, hard to, 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 to for people to maintain that over time. Um, I do think, you know, and I don't think that bariatric surgery is the answer either. You know, I think um, we're going to need to look at combinations of treatment in the longer term. I think if you look at bariatric surgery and the changes that you get in GI hormones within a few days and the reductions that you see in glucose without even preceding the weight loss, there will be other, I'm sure, clever peptide treatments in the future but I don't think TZDs are the answer for diabetes prevention. I think we've been there and done those trials and overall the risk benefit is not, uh, not great. Sure, thank you. Uh, Ala, this question is to you from uh, Dr. Ahmed Hassoun. Which class of antihypertensive drug is best to balance the harm of erythropoietin on hypertension? Uh, well, uh, with regard to erythropoietin stimulating agents, um, there is no specific antihypertensive drug that has been uh, claimed to be beneficial compared to others. However, uh, in patients who are not hypertensive from the start and they're already on dialysis, the recommendation is to use the dialysis with ultrafiltration. However, if we talk about pharmacologic therapy, there is no specific drug class superior to others. Thank you. And one more question, Ala. If you started a patient who's hypertensive while admitting them for a subarachnoid hemorrhage with a blood pressure maximum of 150 and the post-discharge blood pressure was 110 to 119, a zistral 2.5 milligram, can you reduce it or stop it in three months time post-discharge? Uh, well, uh, the, the criteria, as I mentioned, when we start to withdraw or taper the antihypertensive medications, is that the patient should be maintaining a good blood pressure for at least one year. So the patient has to be on antihypertensive treatment for one year with controlled blood pressure, then you start considering tapering the antihypertensive treatment. Okay, and how about the combo therapy? Is it given at night or in the morning? Uh, it depends on the combination of medications. So if the combination contains a diuretic, I'd still prefer to give it in the morning to avoid the, um, I mean, going to the bathroom more frequently during uh, the night time. So I give it in the morning. And if it is a combination with any other drug, for example, a calcium and AC inhibitor or ARB, it could be given morning or, or evening time because it has a longer half-life and there is no worries about side effects during the day. Okay, now this question I will put for you, Ala, and Professor Melanie Davis may uh, also step in with this question, uh, which is from our colleague, Dr. Hassoun. What if the atherosclerosis calculator does not suit uh, our Arab population since we, they were not included? How to correct for that? Well, Any uh, if, if I may uh, comment, uh, it's, it's an interesting question, Dr. Hassoun, because uh, calculating the cardiovascular risk for, for patients is essential to determine the type and, and the uh, intensity of treatment. Uh, there was um, a recent study by a group of cardiologists from United Arab Emirates who tried to verify the available risk calculators 
uh, it has been published this year. I'm, I'm not sure which month in last one. And they were Dr. Sharif Bakir and Dr. Uh, Abdullah Shab. They looked at different cardiovascular risk um, calculators and they tried to verify it among UAE nationals. And uh, unfortunately, there was poor agreement with the cardiovascular risk calculators that has been developed outside with our population. So for now, we don't have a specific cardiovascular risk calculator or uh, that fits our population. And I think it's time to start uh, thinking about that. Um, one, one more point, if um, you try to use the European risk calculators by the European Society of Cardiology, which is the SCOR, uh, the Europeans themselves say the SCOR calculator should be used only for Europeans uh, because it has been developed in that area and it is validated in their population. And the second uh, thing with the SCOR calculator is not compatible with diabetic patients. It has not been verified in patients with diabetes. So. Um, probably patients with diabetes and the score calculator is outside what we what we can use in in our area any comment professor melini on this yeah i think it's really i mean it's a really important point and i think that you know it's really important that that, that in any risk calculator whether it's for diabetes uh, prevention or, or cardiovascular disease that it has to be validated in the population that you're using it in with regard to the use of these cardioprotective drugs in terms of glucose lowering agents, of course, these guidance were developed for the aid for North America and Europe, but they're based on global studies, which did have quite a lot of different populations. And they're, they're not, we're not using risk scores. We're saying that if somebody has got a diagnosis of chronic kidney disease and microalbuminuria or macroalbuminuria, if they've got a diagnosis of heart failure, or if they have had an MI or, or um, you know, other um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and left ventricular hypertrophy, there's, I don't think there's any reason to think that these drugs would not be cardioprotective in, in, in the local population. But I think for risk scores, absolutely, they need to be validated in, in their own populations. Thank you very much. Uh, Ala, what cutoff point you worry about for a low diastolic blood pressure? Uh, again, uh, important question. Um, see, the Europeans in their guidelines do suggest not to go below 120 over 70. But sometimes, and in most of the time, in elderly patients, we do have a diastolic blood pressure that goes below 70, or from the start, it is below 70, while systolic blood pressure is very high. So when we treat a systolic, isolated systolic blood pressure, we do expect the diastolic to drop. Um, there is no specific cutoff point, but I think it will be uh, safe uh, up till 50 millimeter, uh, until 50, the diastolic blood pressure would be safe. Okay. Uh, any thought, Professor Melanie, on this, or you agree with Dr. Alaa's view? I agree. Okay. Uh, Dr. Amin, uh, one of the patients who's uh, 74 years of age, who's on uh, a Torvastat 20 milligram, and he has no diabetes, and recently his blood pressure is 150 uh, to 160, uh, or 180 to 70, and the diastolic is 74, complaining of occipital headache. And the doctor who asked this question had just started him on Valzartan 80 milligram OD. Is this is a good choice for this age? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. It's, a, it's an interesting question and commonly seen on daily practice. Uh, I, yes, I, I do agree with his starting uh, protocol. Uh, first of all, this uh, patient, if we uh, manage to, to measure the blood pressure at least twice with the blood pressure cutoff point above the threshold that we agreed on. Then uh, we label him as um, hypertension and we do start uh, pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatment um, um, together. So um, as we agreed on, we need to start with a small dose and go slow. So uh, starting with any one of the first liners as we agreed, that either thyroid diuretics or CCP or RAS blockers. RAS blockers uh, may be a good option if the patient is having a favorable kidney uh, function. Um, it will be even more favorable if the patient is having any other comorbidities like uh, renal disease or even proteinuria. Uh, if he doesn't have, um, choosing either CCP or RAS blocker or thyroid diuretic could be an, an option. And uh, giving an, a, another factor that the racial descent of the patient. So uh, 
as, as um, well eluded in all guidelines that uh, patients with uh, African descent may benefit more from CCP and uh, beta blockers. And the risk of angioedema goes higher and higher in those um, African descent patients. So we usually start with CCP or beta blockers and then um, RAS blockers. So if the patient is not from the, an African descent, this uh, starting with Valdertan was a right option. We may need to go with a higher dose or combination after a while. Bearing in mind that uh, the recommendation now, if the systolic is more than 20 and the diastolic is more than 10 of the cutoff point, we may need to start with two medications in combination. But this is a senior uh, citizen. We need to start with a small dose, single combination, and take a recovery. Okay. And I mean, is there is any specific therapy for a diastolic hypertension? Yeah, the historic hypertension, the preference is usually goes for the, the CCBs, um, but all the first line therapies can be added. Probably CCBs or RAS blockers will be better than thiazide diuretics in that. So uh, usually the starting medication is CCB followed by RAS blocker. If not treated, then uh, diuretics. Thank you. And how about if you have a patient who's in his 50s, um, hypertensive, uh, mainly diastolic and on uh, triple therapy, uh, I mean, a combo of valsartan, amlodipine, and indepamide, and now his uric acid is rising. Uh, so uh, and he have also tachycardia. So is there is a room for a beta blocker? Okay. Or should they discontinue the indepamide? Question. That's a very interesting question. It depends on the, where this patient is. Is he in, in um, a specialized clinic or um, a, a general clinic? Um, by definition, this uh, gentleman is, um, is, goes under category of resistant hypertension. He's already on three medications and the blood pressure is still, still is not controlled. The consensus here is to refer this patient to a specialized high blood pressure or hypertension center to uh, first of all, look for causes of resistant hypertension, look for causes of secondary hypertension, and uh, probably we go for non-pharmacologic interventional therapies. So um, starting with one medication, going for three medications and still uncontrolled, it has to be referred to a tertiary hospital or a tertiary care. This is to start with. Changing thiazide diuretics with other with beta blockers, um, we can treat the, the hyperuricemia by uh, giving antihyperuricemic measures. However, with the endopamide, the risk of hyperuricemia is much lower than thiazide diuretics. So uh, ultimately, the patient may need beta blockers add-on, may need to change the, the thiazide diuretics or the, um, the endipamide to spironolactone, which may be more um, helpful in this category of patients. However, this patient needs to be uh, referred to a tertiary care um, for further management. Thank you, Lamine. Professor Melanie, what is the cutoff of estimated GFR for the use of SGLT2? So that's changing quite rapidly and it depends on the agent and the region of the world that you live in. So as you know, it's been coming down and down. So initially, for example, with dapafaglosin, it was initially an EGFR of 60 and those were the patients that were recruited into Declare had to have an EGFR above 60. Whereas um, now, uh, for example, uh, example in DAPA CKD, the EGFR has gone right down to about 20. Although the license, um, so the license still, I think, in the UK is around to 45. So although the EGFR licenses are coming down, there's catching up with the evidence. So I think in the longer term, we will be using these, these agents down to EGFRs of, uh, of 20 or 30. But that we need, uh, that's really for around uh, prevention of progression of chronic kidney disease their glucose lowering efficacy at low EGFRs is quite poor, which is why they weren't really licensed um, in those patients to start with. So it depends what you're using them for. If you're using them as glucose lowering agents, we need to use them within license. And at the moment, that's probably at EGFRs um, down to 45. I think, you know, in Canada, it's down to 30 now for empathoglosin. For chronic kidney disease progression, I think in the medium to long term, uh, the, the EGFR license will, will, will indication will fall and we'll be low, using them at much lower EGFRs. Thank you. And the last question to you, uh, Professor uh, Melanie, but it sounds interesting, so I don't know. Some studies show that decreased cardiovascular event 
with alpha glucosidase inhibitor. Do you agree with this? And he provided also the link for it. Yeah, so I couldn't open the link. So apologies for that. Or my, that's my technical. So to my knowledge, uh, there was a study called Stop Nidum, which looked at uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitors. And, and there was some suggestion uh, of reduction in cardiovascular events. There was a larger study called ACE, that was um, uh, conducted with Ruri Holman's group in Oxford in China, which really was a little bit disappointing in terms of cardiovascular outcome. And I'm not aware of large mega outcome studies in people with diabetes. So I think, you know, um, uh, ACABOs and, and other agents are used in, in parts of the world and, and particularly in China and other places, and they do have reasonable efficacy. I think there isn't a really robust uh, in people with established diabetes of reducing cardiovascular outcomes though. Right, thank you very much, Professor uh, Melanie. We come to the uh, uh, closing of this session, but uh, I would like to ask the audience to wait with us because we will have symposium for the uh, sponsor. Uh, Professor Melanie, thank you for the excellent presentations and for connecting with us for the past uh, uh, two uh, webinars. And we look forward for more collaboration in the future with you. Have a great uh, okay, lovely day. Lovely to you all. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Ala and Lamin, uh, for the excellent uh, presentations. And uh, we will proceed with our uh, sponsor, um, uh, talk, uh, and I have a great pleasure now to introduce uh, the speaker for the symposium of uh, HICMA, and many thanks for the sponsor for supporting us for this activity. The, uh, uh, the talk will be covered by uh, Dr. Mohamed Salim. He's a director of intervention cardiology and endovascular medicine, uh, the Heart and Vascular Center at American Hospital here in Dubai, and he's going to cover the evidence base use of diuretic. Uh, Dr. Ah Mohammed, please unmute your mic and share your screen. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Yes, that's fine. And your screen is fine. You can yeah. go ahead. Okay, very good, very good. Thank you very much for having me here tonight. I'm sure it was a very long night, but I've been uh, following uh, all the sessions and it's really great uh, panel and a great uh, deal of information. So I'm gonna try to make this uh, short and light at the end of this uh, long evening. Uh, my disclosure just uh, being contracted by HECMA to conduct this session and I have no financial interest uh, in, uh, in the company. Uh, so uh, trial and error have been uh, always the, uh, the main source uh, of, of improvement. This is what uh, we have been uh, learning throughout the years. Uh, and it has been the, um, the, the, the source of, uh, of change uh, and improvement. And uh, it has been uh, the most um, enriching to the human experience uh, in, uh, in the growth and development. Uh, so if we look at the hypertension, which is, uh, which has been the main uh, topic of this uh, session, uh, it's been an old and never ending story. And if we can see, uh, how far we came along, uh, uh, throughout the years, uh, this, uh, quote is from the textbook of cardiology in the 1930. And uh, if you can see hypertension uh, was seen as a, a compensatory mechanism, which should not be tampered with. And uh, even uh, we were not sure if we can even control it. Uh, FDR, which uh, was the greatest leader of the United States during the World War II, uh, he was given a clean bill of health uh, by his physician with a blood pressure of 220 over 120. And uh, this was, uh, uh, thought to be okay uh, up until the afternoon of April 12, 1945, when he uh, slumped forward after saying that he has a terrific headache. Uh, the whole world was uh, kind of hoping for a similar scenario uh, last week, but uh, for some people, this unfortunately didn't happen. And for some people, fortunately, it didn't happen. So uh, uh, what we know about hypertension is uh, that it is uh, uh, definitely a, a source of uh, worsening risk for uh, cardiovascular events. It increases the fold uh, by eight, uh, eight times as exponentially. Uh, 
uh, with the increase in the blood pressure. Uh, even in that uh, uh, range where we call it the, the normal range between 120 and 140, even that high normal compared to the normal and the optimal, there has been uh, differences in the cardiovascular outcome and the cumulative incidence of events. Uh, the awareness, uh, however, and uh, the number of people treated and the number of people actually can have a controlled blood pressure hasn't been uh, what we were looking for over the last, uh, since 1976 uh, to the year 2000, almost 25 years. And uh, the, the awareness uh, and the uh, number of people treated and number of people controlled has not been uh, what we we're looking for and was still uh, around the range of 50% uh, 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 people who are actually controlled on target. Uh, this is true across uh, all ethnic groups and all uh, regions, maybe best in, in North America, but still uh, the BP at target still uh, suboptimal. Uh, certainly in our area uh, and in the UAE, there was still uh, struggling with the, the uh, adequate control of the blood pressure. Uh, and uh, also we know that uh, as like the hypertension increases the risk uh, exponentially, uh, lowering the blood pressure also, uh, we've known that uh, it uh, improved uh, the outcome significantly. Uh, even a modest, uh, a modest reduction of the blood pressure, either systolic or by two to five millimeter, even uh, significantly improve uh, the cardiovascular outcome, uh, death from stroke, death from uh, coronary heart disease, and all cause mortality. Um, hypertension is is not like LDL. Uh, we uh, it's not lower is better. We know that there is uh, a certain limit that uh, we, uh, if we go below that, we, we see some uh, detrimental side effect uh, related to hypertension. Uh, but uh, but the, uh, 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 for the blood pressure, we have been kind of struggling to, to see how, um, how, how low we should go. Uh, we have been under the impression that 120 over 80 is the best, uh, um, level that we should be at, but we were uh, uh, accepting uh, 140 uh, as a, a decent cutoff. Uh, until recently, the sprint uh, trial uh, was uh, finalized in this, uh, comparing uh, the strategy of standard treatment versus intensive treatment uh, to the range of 120. And uh, this showed a significant reduction in cardiovascular outcome and a significant uh, reduction in mortality. Just a reminder, with the inclusion criteria, it included people greater than 50 years with a star blood pressure 130 over 180 uh, with an additional cardiovascular risk. And uh, it mainly excluded diabetics and people with previous stroke and congestive heart failure and chronic kidney disease. And the highlight of this study was uh, that uh, it was stopped earlier because of uh, uh, proven uh, benefit and uh, also the, the blood pressure response at the baseline was. Uh, uh, around 140, uh, the most uh, uh, calcium channel blocker that was used was amlodipine. The most uh, the diuretic uh, of choice that was used during this trial was chlorothaladone, and uh, the main antihypertensive were the uh, renal angiotensin system inhibitor. Um, the effect uh, actually was more pronounced in the elderly, greater than 75, showed greater uh, risk reduction. Uh, and as well in the all cause mortality. So we know that uh, hypertension is, uh, is bad and we know that we need to treat it and treating the hypertension result in uh, uh, reducing the risk for uh, complication and cardiovascular events and death. But uh, how can we do that? Uh, I think this was uh, alluded to by Dr. Bakris that we should not forget uh, uh, the basics, uh, the, the physical activity, moderation of alcohol intake, and the weight loss and the healthy diet and uh, uh, reducing the intake of uh, sodium. Uh, and just uh, a quick reminder about the types of salt uh, that uh, it's not only white, uh, it's also black and red and yellow, green, brown and clear. So uh, these are all types of salt that we should be uh, uh, educating our patients to avoid.
but uh, like we saw, this is only uh, will would be able lifestyle modification can only reduce the blood pressure by about five to ten points. Uh, but uh, the the medication is uh, is the cornerstone of management here. And um, just looking for primary prevention of cardiovascular complication, probably there is not much difference uh, between medication classes and just uh, lowering the blood pressure is the most important uh, than the choice of drug really. But for secondary cardiovascular protection, like we, uh, Dr. Lamine um, uh, alluded to that there are different groups that would benefit from different classes uh, based on evidence. Um, angiotensin, uh, our renin, renin angiotensin system has been uh, the, the, the drug of, uh, of choice to control the hypertension. Uh, these are generally very well tolerated medications, uh, including ACE inhibitor and ARB. ARB is generally very well tolerated, uh, and these are quite effective uh, medications. Uh, in lowering the blood pressure. But uh, just uh, looking at the uh, um, current ARBs that are most commonly used, uh, they uh, adhere to uh, the... Uh, uh, they, they adhere to the uh, uh, anti-angiotensin uh, uh, blocker receptors. And if we look at the... the if we compare the uh, uh, different ARBs, uh, like Omisartan and Valsartan and Tilmisartan uh, with the Azilsartan, uh, we can see that uh, the Azilsartan has a greater affinity for the receptor and uh, the washout period, during the washout period, there is uh, less dissociation between the uh, molecule and the receptor, uh, which uh, makes uh, the medication more stable. Uh, and uh, this was reflected in uh, uh, clinically in comparing bet uh, between the placebo and Valsartan and Olmosartan and Isosartan uh, at different dosage. And uh, uh, it shows uh, that there is a statistically uh, significant uh, difference or uh, more reduction uh, in, uh, in the group treated with the Isosartan compared to the uh, Valsartan and Olmosartan. Uh, and uh, this was also is shown by a greater number of people uh, that are controlled on the uh, ISSR-10 uh, 40 milligram and 80 milligram compared to uh, uh, the other comparators. Uh, in, in the diabetic subgroup uh, still uh, hold the same. Uh, the, the medication also ISSR-10 was more effective in the pre-diabetics and diabetics. Uh, this is compared to OMSR-10 and also compared to uh, valsar uh, there is a greater uh, reduction uh, in the uh, uh, systolic blood pressure uh, related to the uh, compared between the um, Isosartan and the Valsartan. Uh, and like we heard, uh, usually a single drug is uh, most of the time is not going to be effective to control uh, blood pressure. We need uh, more than one medication with different mechanism of action to achieve the target. And uh, it is uh, most of the people, even our practice, uh, and I'm, I'm sure everybody experienced that, that they cannot uh, control the blood pressure with uh, uh, one medication. Uh, and if we can look even uh, between the patients who are without chronic kidney disease and with chronic kidney disease, the average uh, uh, number of medication needed to control the blood pressure uh, is at least two, if not three or four uh, medication. Diuretics have been uh, the main, um, or along with calcium channel blocker that we add to the, uh, usually the uh, uh, RAS inhibitor medication to uh, get adequate blood pressure control. Hydrochlorothiazide have been the uh, most uh, used uh, diuretic. Um, and that's uh, really for unclear reason to me because most of the data really uh, is not for the hydrochlorothiazide, it's actually for the chlorothalidone. If you look at the uh, pharmacokinetic characteristics of the thiazide diuretics, we can see that chlorothalidone is, uh, is really have, uh, is more stable by more protein binding and uh, uh, longer half-life compared to the hydrochlorothiazide. And uh, that is uh, reflected uh, by uh, the potency, so you need uh, triple the amount of the dosage of, uh, of the chlor of the hydrochlorothiazide to achieve the same reduction uh, compared to the chlorothalidone. And uh, in the clinical trials, uh, there have been uh, starting from uh, uh, in the early 90s in the all trial, uh, 
uh, chlorothaladone was superior to amlodipine and lisinopril in preventing uh, cardiovascular disease. Same thing in the SHEP trial, MRFIT and uh, HDFP. Uh, they all uh, showed uh, uh, strong evidence for uh, chlorothaladone, which reduced mortality by in the range between 17 and 36 percent. And uh, that's why uh, in uh, most of the uh, national guidelines, uh, when, uh, when they talk about the diuretic of choice, they highlighted uh, chlorothaladone as, uh, as the more potent and uh, in reducing the blood pressure more effective and uh, uh, has more uh, data uh, from uh, different trials and uh, randomized trials. And uh, recently, the uh, American Diabetes Association highlighted also that the chlorothalidone should be the diuretic of choice uh, when considering it, uh, adding it to the ACE inhibitor or uh, ARB. Uh, so we have a strong uh, molecule, which is uh, of uh, the ACE of Sartan is a strong ARB and a strong uh, diuretic, which is a chlorothalidone. So combining it, uh, we expect this to provide a good, uh, effective, uh, strong medication to control uh, resistant uh, hypertension. So uh, the uh, uh, actually the manufacturer compared the uh, combination of the chlorothalidone with the azosartan versus azosartan and hydrochlorothiazide, and there has been statistically significant difference uh, with uh, in favor of the combination of the azosartan and chlorothalidone. Uh, and this uh, made analysis of uh, many studies involving the ARB and diuretic combination. Uh, the mean difference between the uh, azosartan chlorothaladone combination uh, versus uh, different uh, ARBs with hydrochlorothiazide uh, is, uh, is showing significant difference uh, in effectiveness uh, in favor of uh, the combination of azosartan and chlorothaladone. And uh, this will uh, shows that the combination will result in more patient controlled. So this graph illustrates that uh, each drug alone or each molecule alone will result in less uh, effective control compared to the combination. Uh, for example, if we look at the, uh, someone with a blood pressure of 160, then about 85% uh, of, the, of these patients will be controlled with, uh, with the combination molecule. Uh, compared to uh, a single molecule. So uh, the re recommended dose for uh, uh, Adarbi, which is the uh, Isilsartan, uh, is a, what, to start with 40 milligram, uh, for, uh, especially for patients who have high, high dose of uh, diuretics, and, uh, but if not as a single drug is 80 milligram. And if the blood pressure is not controlled, uh, then additional blood pressure reduction can be achieved by uh, taking uh, uh, the Darby with other antihypertensive agents and certainly combining it with uh, the chlorothaladone, Darby chlor uh, will provide a very uh, a strong uh, a blood pressure reduction. Um, in, in clinical practice, we, um, you know, I'm, I'm, at least in my experience, I find this very uh, effective combination compared to the other uh, um, multiple drugs or, or poly pill, and uh, it provides really a good uh, uh, blood pressure reduction and it's uh, uh, very well tolerated by patients. Uh, it can be administered with, uh, with other antihypertensive and it can be administered with or without food, uh, which makes it uh, very convenient for the patients. And uh, that's about it for the night for me. And uh, we... Uh, we're trying to find uh, always uh, new things to make uh, uh, life easier for our patients uh, with the, if we can find a medication that can be effective as a one pill, it's always better than uh, giving them multiple drugs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed Salam, for this elegant uh, presentation. And I've got one question here to ask you is uh, sure. in, in what way is the uh, is your tan superior to other member in the same class? Uh, it is it is superior in uh, in terms of the uh, how the, the as we said that the uh, binding to the uh, receptor is uh, is much stronger, and uh, we find uh, that um, you know it's actually from experience uh, 
from the clinical experience, we found this to be uh, very effective compared to others, but also from the trials that we was illustrated, it was uh, compared to Valsartan, for example, or Termisartan or Omisartan, there is a greater reduction. So uh, I uh, personally find it to be uh, for the patients who are, um, you know, somewhat resistant. Uh, and I think it is, it provides a greater reduction uh, in the blood pressure. Uh, without the need for triple therapy. Okay, thank you. And there's one more question. Uh, sure. um, this is from a primary health doctor who's saying that, you know, in case of emergency, uh, they, uh, beside the cap, uh, caputin sublingual, is there is any other antihypertensive drug which can be safe in hypertensive emergency, especially when they are in the clinic and it is not in the, uh, it is not a hospital setup. So what do you recommend? Uh, if it's not in the hospital setup, uh, I would recommend the, uh, I find it the catapress, the clonidine, I think is a pretty good uh, oral, uh, not sublingual, uh, 0.1 milligram. I find this, it's an old drug, but uh, it is, uh, I find it very effective in uh, lowering the blood pressure uh, uh, quickly, but not as bad as, I mean, we used to, uh, to use uh, the nifedipine, which now is falling out of favor because of the, you know, uh, rapid uh, reduction uh, in the blood, uh, very fast reduction and the reflex tachycardia and all that. But I find uh, the catapress to be uh, uh, an effective uh, way to, uh, you know, as a pill uh, to give the patient in the clinic setting. In the hospital setting, I'm, now I use the uh, tachyben, I think is a very good uh, uh, effective uh, drug. It's an intravenous medication, very well tolerated and uh, very effective. Thank you very much. Dr. Muhammad, thank you for this uh, presentation. As we are going to come to the uh, end of session, I would like to thank uh, you and I would like to thank also all my colleagues, uh, you know, Dr. Ala, the mastermind behind the, uh, the hypertension webinar uh, on behalf of Emirates Diabetes Society Board. I would like personally to thank you, Dr. Ala, for this uh, excellent series that you brought over the past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I also thank you also to Dr. Amin, who had supported us also uh, in this uh, series of webinar, uh, and he was also partner in this from the beginning. Uh, and I'm sure that we're going to have many more of, uh, uh, you know, good uh, presentation and series of lecture that we are planning uh, for, uh, you know, till the end of this year, as well as by the beginning of 20. Uh, you know, 2020. So really um, many thanks to uh, Ala Al Amin for this, uh, uh, you know, for your support towards EDS and for, uh, you know, taking part in the continued medical education uh, for our colleague, whether here in UAE or across the region. And also I would like to thank our uh, speaker, uh, Professor George Bakri, who was not able to be with us, but he was kind enough to record the lecture and also uh, for Professor Melanie Davis to connect with us all the way from UK. And uh, of course, many thanks to our uh, sponsor for tonight, Al Hikma, for the whole team, uh, for the, all the organization and for their kind and generous support toward the EDS, and also to our event organizer, uh, MCI. And of course, before and overall, to all our attendees, who just waited with us till uh, now. We have still 667 uh, attendees with us uh, till now. Uh, so then many thanks. And uh, we promise you, uh, you know, uh, through the EDS to bring, uh, you know, lots of good education. Uh, and uh, in for the CME, you can just fill the um, evaluation form as I mentioned, and you expect to receive your CME within uh, seven days. Also, uh, you know, we will be having other activities also coming uh, soon, 16 and 17 of October. Uh, we will be having the EDS uh, consensus guideline for the management of type 2 diabetes. For uh, those of you who had missed that the first round, you can attend uh, this one. We have an excellent speaker who are the author of the guideline who's going to join us on those uh, two days. We will also have the Young Leader uh, Forum. One is on 18th of November and one uh, in, uh, on 9th of December. And as I promised that by 2021, we will have also, uh, you know, you'll have a new look for uh, the EDS. So uh, many thanks. And again, many thanks for our sponsor uh, for all those five webinars 
who helped us uh, throughout this process. Uh, thank you very much and have a great evening and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you.